Hey everyone, uh, thanks, ve Ooh, that's really loud. Uh, thanks very much for coming to this tutorial this afternoon. Um, so I'm Kevin, I'll be the instructor uh, for, this, um, for this course. Uh, just a little bit about me, I work at a company called Cambridge Park. Uh, we're doing uh, courses in, in data science and all sort of um, workshops a bit like this one. Um, just a little bit, um, so I've sent an email Yesterday, I've seen at least some of you uh, received it. I already got a, a pull request uh, on my repository. So you'll see, if you've got that email, you'll see a link to, um, to GitHub where I've hosted all the, uh, all the content for today. Um, so if you check the readme, I've got some instructions on how, um, how to install everything. So you've got two options. First one is you set it up on your, on your machine. Uh, so it's just a matter of installing the requirements. So you've got a requirements.txt with all the libraries and the versions you'll need. Uh, and then start a Jupyter notebook. So it's all based in notebook. Um, if you haven't done that, you can either do it now, but it might be a bit slow on the, on the network. Otherwise, you've got a second option, which is to use Google Colab. So I don't know if you've all used it before, um, but basically you just click on one of those links and it should bring you to Google Collab. Yeah, and so you've got the, the notebooks loaded there and you can just work in the, in the browser directly. Uh, there's an extra step at the beginning where you're just setting up and installing all the libraries, so that might take a minute or so and then you can, um, you can get started. Um, so that's it for the install instructions. Then just a quick word about the, the structure of the repo. So we'll have three main notebooks that we're gonna work through today. Each notebook is divided, um, is like has two versions, a version skeleton, which has some holes in it and that's where you're gonna have to work on. And then a version solution if you just wanna go straight to, uh, straight to the solution and see how, uh, how to do the different exercises. Um, yeah, and then this morning someone uh, opened a pull request to add an environment YAML. Um, so thank you very much for that. So if you're using Anaconda, you can also directly install, uh, create a new environment with it. Yes, that's pretty much it. Um, and I haven't added the slides yet, but uh, I, I will um, just after this talk, I'll, uh, I'll push them there so you can also access them. Right, so this, this tutorial is about um, Model interpretability. So that's how we will um, divide the time. So first, an introduction, explaining a bit uh, why why do we even care about it? Why do we want to do that? Uh, and then we'll we'll see three main libraries. So the first one, Eli five, uh, and a technique called permutation importance. That is the the most basic um, place to get started for model interpretability. And then two other libraries that are a bit more advanced. The first one, Lime. Um, stands for local interpretable model agnostic explanations, and then SHAP, which um, is probably the most advanced one here. Um, just another thing, we'll have a break at 3 p.m., so it's in about an hour and a half, so right in the middle of the session. Cool. So first, uh, why, why do we care about model interpretability? interpretability? Why, um, why do we want to do that? Well, let's take this, um, this scenario. So you've, you've worked um, quite hard on, your, uh, on a project. You've cleaned and pre-processed some really messy data. You've engineered some really fancy features. You're really happy with that. Uh, you've done a lot of work to select the best, um, the best model and tune it properly. And then you, you've got a final model that has really good performance on some, uh, on some test sets. So you're pretty proud of that. You're pretty happy. Uh, but then there's a there's a catch, your boss comes to you and is asking, well, just one more thing, can you, uh, can you explain how your model works? Can you explain how, um, how is your model taking decisions? What does your model care about in the data? Uh, and that, unless you, you take the steps to actually, um, to actually try to understand your model, you usually not know the, the answer, or at least it's not straightforward. Um, so that's what, we, uh, what we're gonna do today. So, just um, a, quick, uh, a quick word, so you, you all know that algorithms are 
everywhere and more and more industries are starting using machine learning in their, um, in their work. So you'll have things like insurance or banks or even the police trying to build models to predict all sorts of things. Uh, and there, like, that actually has an impact on people, the predictions that those models will do. So if you work for an insurance, maybe it will define whether or not, uh, like, how much you're going to be um, charged for a specific plan. Or if you work for a bank, your model might decide who is going to get a loan or not. So it's really important to know um, how your model works and how it takes its decisions. If you have, if you work for a bank, you don't want your model to have any sort of bias um, in like who it's going to give a loan to or not. Um, and another example that I quite like is social media. So it might look like a less important one than the three others here, but um, I think it's equally, uh, it can have an equally bad impact on people. So let's say you, um, you're working on a model that should predict who is most likely to click on, um, on an ad on whatever social media you're working for. Um, and let's say you're working for an advertiser that, um, I don't know, is, do is doing uh, online, uh, online gambling. So then your model, if, uh, if you don't take care, will probably try to target someone who is uh, addicted to gambling. And we'll try to find in the, in the data set some features that are a good proxy to know who is addicted to gambling. Because that's, uh, that's, those are the people that would be the most likely to, to click on an, an ad. So that can have a really bad impact on, uh, on people, even though that seems to be a fairly um, simple thing. So, all of that to say that black box models are not really an option, and you will need to um, you will need to interpret them if you work in all those fields where you might have a, quite a bad impact on uh, I mean, powerful impact on people. So, I like to see interpretability having three uh, three main goals. So the first one is building trust in your model. Um, so here, another example: you're trying to predict employees' performance for a large organization. Uh, and the data you've got available is performance reviews uh, from the past 10 years, for example. Uh, but then what if the company just tends to promote men more than women? Uh, then your model, the only thing your model is going to do is try to, uh, to mimic this, um, this process that your company already has and will learn from this bias. So even if you're quite happy with your model at the end, your model has a really high, um, high accuracy, the only thing it will be doing is looking at the gender uh, as a priority to predict, uh, to predict uh, the performance of people, which if you don't actually look inside the model how it works, you will not necessarily notice and you'll end up putting that in production and potentially be really damaging. So there's a, there's a really good quote from uh, Cathy O'Neill uh, about that which is models are opinions embedded in mathematics. So your model is only as good as your, as your data. And it's really important to understand what your model is picking uh, in the data to make its precisions, its predictions. The second um, kind of aspect that I like to, to see is it helps decision makers. So let's say, for example, you work for a hospital and you're gonna have to predict the likelihood of a patient to develop, I don't know, some disease X. Um, and you've got access to symptoms and information about all your patients, and you want to know whether or not they're going to have um, this disease. So here, your model itself will, you'll never put your model in production to directly um, give a treatment to people or anything like that. You'll want this model to be used by doctors uh, to help them with their diagnosis. So you, the doctor will have to not take the prediction itself, but understand how that prediction was made to s then like, try to understand if that makes any sense or not and um, like, just come up with their diagnosis based on that. So here, the, the model is only to empower um, the decision maker. And finally, another example I quite like is uh, using model interpretability to debug your model. Um, so here, an example that is used in the paper from Lime, which is one of the libraries we'll see today, um, is the following. So you've got images of wolves and huskies, and you're trying to build a model that will um, predict, uh, classify those two, those two classes. Um, but then the problem, so they did, people actually built 
really nice model, has a really good accuracy, and they were really happy with that. It predicts, I don't know, 99 point something um, accuracy. What is a wolf? What is a husky? Um, but then when they actually use the library Lime that we'll see later on this, um, on this model to try to understand what was the model uh, looking at in the, in the data to make its predictions, they noticed that the model was just looking in the background because the pictures of huskies or wolves, I forgot which one, tend to have more snow in the background. Um, and that's what they, they notice here when they have, the model is provided with this picture here. It was only looking at the background and saying, if there is snow, it's probably a husky. If there is no snow, it's probably a wolf. Um, so the problem here is that you, you're really happy. You have your fancy model. Uh, you think it's a really good classifier, but it's just basically a snow detector. Uh, it can only, it's only looking at the background, is there snow or not? Um, so that's something that here, model interpret interpreting your model would have helped actually seeing that and not, um, not putting into production before um, before debugging it. So then what, what do we do? Well, first some models uh, will be easy to interpret by, by design. So something like a linear regression, for example, you'll have a weight on each feature and it's really easy for you to interpret exactly, to see exactly what's the impact of each single feature. Uh, so here, if you've got something like that, increasing X1 by one single unit will increase the output by three units. So it's super easy for you to actually explain that model to anyone. Um, same thing for decision tree, right? You've got the exact decision path that was uh, taken to predict something. So here, that's I think some model from the Titanic. Uh, and we see that, well basically, if you're male, you're probably in trouble because um, it goes pretty bad from there and you're the most likely to die. Um, so you, you can explain exactly how your model made prediction and that's, uh, that's pretty good. Some other models uh, will be harder to interpret. So here you've got the example of an ensemble model uh, as an ensemble of trees, something like a random forest. Um, and here it's a bit harder to understand the role of each single feature because you don't have a single tree anymore, you don't have a single decision path. You've got multiple trees that are grouped together in some way. Um, so the good thing is that random forests, since they're based on tree, they can still uh, provide you with a feature importance. But the feature importance is usually just give a number uh, to each feature, like kind of uh, weighting how important it seems to be for your model, but you don't know how a single prediction was made. You don't know exactly how that feature impacts the outcome. Is it positive? Is it negative? Uh, you just know that it seems to be more important than others. So still, not extremely bad, but you won't be able to explain your model properly. And then some other models are just really complicated. So something like a deep neural network, uh, it's really hard to actually explain what's the, um, how changing the input layer will affect your output layer. And it's really hard to explain to someone whenever you've deep known, um, your deep, um, deep neural network has made any prediction, how do you explain what it cared about uh, what it picked in the data. So those models will be seen more as black boxes. So, great, uh, I'm a bit of a joy killer here. Uh, does that mean that you've got to stick to only simple models if you care about um, interpretability? Well, sticking to simple models at least has the advantage that uh, you, the interpretability will be granted. So you're sure to, uh, that you'll be able to explain your model properly. Um, but then there's a trade-off between the interpretability and the performance that you get from the da your data. Uh, and then the second option is to use some of the, those techniques that we'll see today, which are model agnostic, so they'll work with any, uh, any sort of model of arbitrary complexity, um, and they'll allow you to have both the performance and the interpretability. So that's the motivation for what we'll do today. Um, just a quick word on... Um, on like two different types of interpretation before we get started. Um, so I like to divide it as you've got the local interpretations. So those will be basically explaining how a single prediction was made. Uh, for example, in the case of our doctor, for a single, 
a single person, we predicted that they will have a disease, uh, disease Y or X. Um, how do you explain to the doctor how that specific prediction was made? What, uh, what attributes of the patient uh, was important towards uh, making this decision? Uh, and then the global interpretation is more explaining how overall your model will, uh, will work. What, on average, your model seems to care about, uh, what it doesn't seem to care about. So that's the example that we saw with the husky, maybe. Like, you would like to know that, on average, your model tends to look mostly at the background and not actually on the animal itself. Um, or for the, for the case of the hospital, it's also important to explain that those symptoms seem to be important for your model, whereas those other symptoms are never looked at. Um, so those would be the two different kinds of interpretation we can do, and we'll see how all the libraries we'll see today provide one or the other, or sometimes both. Right, so let's get started with the first, um, the first library for today, ELI5. So ELI5 um, stands for Explain Like I'm Five, so it's uh, um, I think f there, there's a subreddit for that where they, they explain uh, all sort of things. Um, so Eli5 ha will have two things, and it implements um, something called permutation importance. That's an algorithm we'll see uh, a bit later. So Eli5, um, it's a, a Python implementation that works with all um, all models that have the scikit-learn API. So any, any sort of model that will have a dot .fit, dot .predict, so that means every model from scikit-learn, that means XGBoost, LightGBM, CatBoost, uh, any, any library that implements a scikit-learn um, API. If you've got white box models, so like models like linear regression, decision tree that are actually easy to open and look, what's, look at what's going on inside, you'll be able to create nice visualization that gives you both a local interpretation and a global interpretation. So it can be really useful to communicate the result of your simple models. Now if you've got more complex models, like, um, I don't know, like some boosting algorithms, some neural networks, uh, it implements another technique called permutation importance. But here, it's only limited to global interpretation. So you won't be able to explain a specific prediction. So that's the plan for, um, for this, first, uh, this first exercise. So just to show you a bit what it will look like, so if you're applying Eli5 on a white box model, so here I think I've applied it on a linear regress logistic regression on the breast cancer data set. Um, so here it gives you something like that. So if you want to explain your model globally, you're just calling the function show weights from Eli5, passing your model, and it will be able to look inside, try to find the weights, uh, and give you some output like that, which I think it's quite nice to, to explain to some decision maker how your model works. So here, that's the breast cancer data set. If I want to go to a doctor and explain what my model seems to care about in the data, uh, I just go with this, um, with this table and I show that, well, the most important, the three most important features seem to be those, um, those three here, asking does it, uh, does it seem to make sense with your intuition uh, and your experience, and those features here seem to have a negative impact. So I think here we're predicting whether, whether um, uh, something is cancerous or not. So in the first, those, those features will increase the probability of it being cancerous. Um, those features here will decrease that probability. So I can start to explain what my models seem to care about uh, when it comes to making decisions based on this data. Then as I said earlier, Li5 on a white box model can also explain how a single prediction was made. So here, if I want to explain a given, uh, a given prediction on a given observation, so for a specific patient, uh, I just call the show prediction function, passing my model and the observation, and it gives me a, a table that is really similar, where it tells me exactly the contribution of each um, of each feature. So here, I know that. The fact that the worst, uh, the worst area contributed that amount to the final decision and the final probability um, is that the, the, um, that the cells aren't uh, cancerous with a probability of uh, 0.79. Um, so I can really explain how that specific prediction was made by, by my model. 
and justify uh, what's, what's going on. Now, if your model isn't white box, so if you can't actually open it and look at what's going on inside, um, AI5 also implements a method called permutation importance. So this one will be model agnostic. You can use it on any, any type of model. It doesn't need to open it. And it will provide, unfortunately, only a global interpretation. So do you have a question? So not even like the so those ones here work only for white box models. So when it can actually find the weights directly in the model. So here those weights are exactly the weights of your logistic regression. Um, here the weights are the the contribution is the weight times the, the actual value of your uh, of the. So, so Eli Five wouldn't tell that to you. If you created a, if you actually created a term yourself for uh, for the interaction, then it will just show that if like the multiplication or whatever. Yeah. Uh, does Eli Five work only for classification models, or does it also work for regression? It works for both regression and classification. Yeah. So that's for white box models. Then, as I said, you can use it on black box models as well, but you'll only get a global interpretation. Uh, and here, even it's not even that good either because it only gives you an amplitude. So really something similar to the feature importance that you're probably used to on, uh, on random forest or decision trees where you will have a number associated to each, um, to each feature and it tells you how relatively to each other they, they're important, but you don't know in which direction they affect the outcome or whatever. Um, so it's quite limited, but it's, it's a nice place to start. So the way that works, Briefly, um, you'll get your, your data set that, and your model that you want to explain, and you'll focus on what uh, each feature one by one. And what you'll do is first, for a given feature, you'll shuffle uh, all the values in the provided data set to kind of um, like make, make this feature not powerful anymore, right? Like whatever your model used to pick and to care about in this feature, since it has been shuffled, it, doesn't, it's not supposed to make any sense anymore. Uh, and then you'll generate predictions using this new data set, using your model on this new data set, and you'll compute the decrease in accuracy. So you're expecting the accuracy to go down once you've shuffled that, uh, that feature, and this decrease in accuracy corresponds to the impact of um, the importance of that feature for your model. Yes? No, the shuffling is for, so for each feature, you, fo you pick a feature, you've got all the values, and you shuffle uh, completely all the values for that specific column. Uh, yeah, you don't mix the columns together. <laughs> no, so, um, so yeah, like shuffling it is kind of equivalent to, to deactivating that feature, or like deactivating its predictive power. Um, and then you just have to compare the, the impact on accuracy of each of the features, and that gives you the importance of the feature. So it's a pretty simple method. Um, and that's how it would work with, with Eli5. So you'd import the permutation importance um, model that has scikit-learn API, so it's quite nice. You just import it, instantiate it with your model, then you call dot .fit on your data sets, uh, whichever data set you're trying to explain, and then you just call show weights, same way we did before, in order to display this. Um, so in fact, it, it will not shuffle it only once, it will shuffle it a couple of times, return the average, um, the average importance of that feature and the standard deviation as well. So you, you get a little bit, bit more information, but you still don't know in which way this affects your model. If we go back here, um, we see that each feature, I know if it affects, it, if affects the outcome positively or negatively, um, because that's a white box model with permutation importance. I only have this, I only have this, which is just the amplitude of the impact. Right, so any, any questions about that? Oh, yes? It seems like that would be really expensive. If you train the model once, uh -huh. and then we test it, and in order to reverse engineer So you don't retrain the model. Oh, uh, you just okay. generate predictions, yeah. Yeah, okay, um, cool. So we've got the first, um, 
the first practical then, which you can either open this notebook if you've got it locally. If not, you can just go there on Google Colab, click on skeleton, Oops, let's open that. And you'll have that. I think you sh might look a bit different because you're not the owner of the notebook, so I think there'll be something open in Playground or something like that that you can click on with that will just open it on your own um, Google Drive. And then you can start um, working on it. Um, so the way we'll do that is that you can all um, start going through the, um, this notebook. I'm uh, here helping out uh, at work uh, and answer all the questions. And then in, let's say, OK, the time is not right here. Um, let's say in 20 minutes, I'll go through the notebook, and we'll go through it together. And uh, I'll take all the questions and everything and explain what's, what's going on. Cool. Twenty minutes? Twenty five? Let's see. Depends how. Yeah, let's go through it together at 10 past.
Did you guys get to the permutation importance part already? Yes, no? Cool. So you've got that format as data frame. So I think you you're passing the unique string to the unique input, and then you're passing the unique All right, do you want a little bit more time or should we go through it together? What do you prefer? Okay. Uh, let's, let's say that I'll go through it. Um, cool, so first thing we do is importing a bunch of things. So just a quick um, explanation of what we've got. So we've got pandas, of course. Uh, we've got some tools that we'll use from scikit-learn, so just to process the data, so the one hot encoder and the column transformer, um, and then the grid search CV and the train test plate, uh, just in order to tune our model properly. Um, then we're importing a couple of metrics, so the balance accuracy score, which is just the accuracy score, but taking into account of the imbalance in the data, and the classification report, so we can see a little bit more about the performance of our models. And then the most important is we're importing uh, four different models. So that's the, 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 the models we'll actually try to interpret for all the different, um, with all the different libraries we'll see, we'll see today. Uh, so logistic regression should be fairly easy to interpret that. Uh, then decision tree, not too hard either. And then things are starting to get complicated. So random forest, it's a bit harder. Uh, and boosting, so here that's light GBM. Uh, so it's really similar to XGBoost. It's the Microsoft version of XGBoost. Um, 
and that's probably the, the most complicated one to, to interpret. Uh, so let's import all of that and then loading some data. So the data that we provided here is um, from a bank in Portugal uh, and that corresponds to some marketing uh, campaign that they ran and they wanted to, um, to have their prospects or clients to subscribe to some, uh, to some plan, I think to some like deposit something, a special plan that they, they, they put together. Um, and so the data has got some information about the different clients, uh, some demographics, some information about their, um, whether they have, uh, they've been in default before or not. And then the, the target, what you're trying to, um, what you're trying to predict is whether or not the person subscribed to the plan. So here, our goal will be first, we want to model that. So we want to build a, a model that can predict given characteristics about the people and the campaign if, uh, if that person actually ended up subscribing. And then the second thing we want to do once we've got that model, we're pretty happy with the model, is go backwards and explain that model, interpret it, so we can maybe give some recommendations to our marketing team and tell them, well, looks like you did something differently at this point, looks like targeting those people is probably more efficient, uh, that, kind of, uh, that kind of recommendation. So let's do that. Uh, first, we're gonna load the data. So that's, uh, that's what I was talking about. We've got a um, lot of different features. They explained a bit um, in more details below, but basically we've got the age of the person, their job, uh, marital status, education, whether or not they've been in default, uh, and then you've got information about the, um, the campaign itself. So we know how those people were contacted. Some were contacted by telephone, some by email. Um, so we want to know if also that affects the outcome. Uh, they've been contacted at different months of the year, so we can also see how that changes something, and at different days of the week. Um, we know also how many times they've been contacted before, so that's the campaign feature, and how many days between two times um, we've contacted them. So here, if we contacted them only once, P days is going to be the maximum because there were no delay between two, uh, two times they were contacted, and it's one, it was on only one time. Um, but sometimes we've got some people that are contacted multiple times in the same week, which might end up not being efficient, or maybe it's really efficient, that's what we want to know. Cool, so with that in mind, just a quick, uh, a quick thing that we need to check is the imbalance in your data. So here, we see that most people actually didn't subscribe to our, uh, our plan, which is a bit disappointing, um, but that's something to keep in mind, because we'll, um, we'll need to ensure that we don't, uh, we don't only look at accuracy straight, because it, be, uh, it wouldn't be representative here. Uh, we also need to stratify when we are uh, creating a trained test set. So first thing is um, we, we're proposing a little bit getting the X, um, the feature matrix with all our features and the target vector Y. Uh, we're mapping no to a zero, yes to a one, and we're ready to get started. So here just quickly check the, the types. So we've got um, few numerical values, so the age, the number of days, number of times they, they've been uh, called so campaign. Uh, and we've got some category, categorical features, so their job, their education, etc. Uh, so you can read more information about all those features right here. I'm not going to describe everything. Uh, so we're ready to go. Um, in order to pre-process the data, we'll first define two different lists because um, we want to treat differently the numerical values and the categorical values. So here, uh, I've just provided list of numerical features, list of categorical features, run that, and then I can create a column transformer object. Who has used a column transformer before? Only one person. Really? Okay, uh, so it's, it's, it's fairly new. It, it was released in scikit-learn version 20, so that's probably the latest. Um, but it's really powerful because it allows you to map a, a different transformation on different, uh, different groups of features. So here I can easily say, well, for my numerical features, so that's the list here, numerical features, uh, I'm just deciding to so pass through means I'm just, I'm just going to keep them as they are and not changing anything. 
But for my categorical features, I'm deciding, I, I decide to use the one hot encoder. So in just one single object, I can decide what transformations I map, um, I map on different features. So it's really powerful. Now I, I, I just run that, and I've got this object, the preprocessor, that I can apply on my data and directly, uh, directly get everything out of it. So once we've got that, we can um, split the data into training set and test set. So I'm going to pass x and y. I'm going to do test size equal, uh, let's do 30%. And I need to make sure I stratify that because it's imbalanced. So I'll do stratify over y. And then out of that, I get x train, x test, y train, y test. Cool, so I'm ready to go. Now I can actually fit this object, so the preprocessor that I've created before. I train it on the tra train set and I call dot transform in order to actually apply the transformation. And that returns something like that. So that's a NumPy array. Not necessarily the easiest to, um, to read, but I've got everything there. Um, the next um, code provided here is just um, an, um, me trying to, uh, to wrap the whole thing into a data frame so it's a bit nicer to visualize and interpret. So I'm just basically getting the list of all the categories that it has created when it created the, when created the dummies. Uh, and I'm here having a list comprehension when I'm basically saying that each, each column should be called the, the name of the feature it maps to. So for example, if, uh, if it's the education, first it's gonna be education, double underscore, and whatever value it has. So education, uh, university, or education, high school, or something. And then I'm just grouping all my features together. So my numerical features that I haven't changed, and my uh, new one hot encoded features. So if I check all features, that's basically a list of names for my features. Right, so job, student, blah, blah, blah. So with that, now what I can do is wrapping my data again into uh, a data frame, and it's much nicer to look at, really. Uh, so I've got all my data here, quite happy with that, and I can start training models. So the first model here will be logistic regression, so I make sure that I have class weight equal balanced. Um, I'm setting a random state just because I'm hoping we'll all get the same results. Hopefully, that will work. Everything will be good. Yes? Uh, can you just explain a little bit how the um, the arguments work in the, in the um, Yes? Up here? Yeah, so Stratify is just, so since my model is imbalanced, um, whenever I'm calling the train test split, which is in charge of uh, separating uh, of like creating a test set and a train set by sampling at random from my data. I want to make sure that the distribution of um, of values in my y uh, target vector will be the same in the test data and in the train data. So like that ratio that I've got up here, that ratio of no's and yeses, I want to make sure that I've got the same ratio on the train set and on the test set. So the to a representative of each other. So Stratify is just doing that by saying Stratify equal Y is just gonna ensure that whenever it's doing the split, I've got the same ratio uh, in the train set and the test set. So back here, I'm training a lot, I'm instantiating a logistic regression. I'll do the same thing for decision tree, random forest and logistic and um, uh, light GBM. So if I just do DT model equal decision tree classifier class weight, same thing. I want that to be balanced. That's pretty much pretty much it. RF model. It's gonna be a random forest. Same story here. I want it to be balanced. And finally, GB model. It's gonna be a light GBM classifier and it needs to also be balanced. So now I've got my four models, so logistic regression, decision tree, random forest, and gradient boosting. And I'm ready to start using Eli5. So first thing, I'll tune my model to make sure it actually has good parameters. 
Uh, I can check the parameters. Best parameters, so here will be C equal one. Um, and the score that I got on the training set was 70% accuracy. And I'll just set my model to be the best estimator, get the parameters just to make sure everything worked well. And now I can do, oops, wait. If I go back here, yes. So now I can just call it, predict on X test, and it generates some predictions, right? Yes. What did that mean? Uh, so, so that's uh, that's the grid search, right? So it, um, I'm telling it, this the logistic regression will have this parameter C. So I want to test multiple versions of C, and you return to me the one that gives the best score. So here it, it tries it tried all those values, and return uh, so apparently the one that has the best score is one. Cool, so I've got my predictions here. Quite happy with that. I can compute the, the accuracy, so I'll do the balance accuracy just to make sure it takes into account the imbalance and properly weights it. Um, and I do white bread, white, no, white test first, white bread. That's the accuracy I've got on the test set, right, 69%. I can also check the classification report white test, white bread, and I need to print that. Right, so I've got, um, got information here, so it's not that good, but whatever. Um, here the idea is not really to have the best model in the world, right? We want, to, we want to spend more time interpreting it. So that's great, I've got my first model, that's a linear model, um, that is white box, so I can actually see the way it's easy to understand it easily. So Eli5 will do that for me. So if I just do Eli5 show weight and I pass my linear model, that's what it provides. Yeah, that's what it provides. So yeah, not, not the nicest, right? I've got the weight, that's great, but the features here are, um, are just numbers, so it's not, Super easy to read. So Eli5 has an argument feature. Oh my god, I can't spell names. And here I can just say X test columns. What did I do wrong? I think it does the same stuff as these others. Oh okay. So I would have to do two lists, right? Yeah, thank you. Right, so yeah, it has to be, the feature names has to be a list. You could, or we could have used the all, all features, the, the list that we created earlier as well. Um, but anyway, so this is much nicer to, to interpret. So here we see that uh, the most important feature in my data set seems to be the fact that the month is March. Uh, so maybe, maybe we've done something different in March. I don't know, it's worth, uh, it's worth asking the marketing team what, what happened in March. Uh, same with a few other months, actually. The fact that the, the person was contacted by, uh, by phone seems to be also important. Maybe students uh, are more responsive. So all those things in green here will increase the probability of the person to subscribe um, to, to subscribe to our, um, to our plan, according to our model. Uh, and the things in red will decrease that probability. So here, maybe in November and August, we, we did things a bit differently that, uh, or like maybe we had less, um, less chances of people subscribing at those months, but uh, it's worth investing a bit more and that's information that we can use, um, I mean not that we can use directly, but that we can start discussing with the domain experts. So here you're not actually expected to, um, to provide a full, uh, a full explanation of everything. It has to be discussed with the, the domain experts. What's going on, does that make sense? Is it, is it a bug maybe? It's not normal that uh, your model picks the month of March, so maybe there's something wrong with your model, or maybe there is actually something meaningful that happened in March. So that's something that needs to be discussed. Right, so with that in mind, now we can uh, look. So as we said earlier, 
if your model is white box, Eli5 also allows you to explain a specific observation. So here we'll select an observation. Um, so I've selected the fourth, the fifth row in the data set, which for some reason is not the same one I had earlier. Great, so uh, the random seed doesn't seem to work so well. Um, anyway, that's fine. Uh, was it number three, four? Okay, I can't find. Do you guys have the one with someone who is 27 years old? Yeah, okay, so it's just me then. That's gonna be fun. Um, oh, yeah, thank you, that's, that's probably it. Um, yes, so I don't have the random seed. So we put random state equal 42, right? You st you're getting what? You get, yeah, you're getting this, okay. M maybe you're just lucky then. <laughs> um, let me go back. Yes, that's the one I wanted, great. Um, so I have selected this row here, so that's person 27 years old. We've contacted that person four times already with on average three times. Uh, three days between two contacts. Um, this person is something, we don't know their job. Uh, I mean, we know it, but uh, I would have to actually do. Anyway, I'm not gonna check the row now, but we would have to go back to the original data set to actually see um, without the one hot encoded features, because here it makes it a bit harder to to find which one is actually equal to one. Um, anyway, and that person ended up subscribing to, that's why I wanted absolutely this one, because uh, that, that specific person subscribed to our plan. So we'll see, we'll try to explain why do we, um, why did that person subscribe to our plan? Uh, and actually something we can verify is that our model our model predicts properly this. Oops. Well, actually, we'll see it when we plot it. So let's just do that. So in order to explain a specific, uh, a specific prediction, we're gonna use show prediction, passing the model, passing the specific observation that we wanna explain. So here, that's my x test i log i, uh, and then the name, of the, the name of the feature. So if I run that, yeah, so here, gives me all the information I need. So first thing tells me, well, the true, uh, the true value that I was supposed to predict is y equal one. I predicted that with a probability of 96%. Um, so my model is quite confident that this person would have subscribed to the, um, to the, to the plan. And here is the, the individual contribution of all the, all the features. So it looks like the most important um, thing my model cares about to, to make this precision is that the, this prediction is, that, is the fact that the marketing team contacted the person um, on their phone. And then the second most important thing is that the person uh, did not have uh, default before. Um, here, also some interesting information. It looks like uh, the fact that we contacted that person four times actually decreased that probability of the person subscribing. So here I have information also about, uh, about how maybe I should have, even though the person still end up, uh, ended up subscribing, it looks like the fact that I contacted them too many times might have uh, decreased my chances. So that's, that's quite interesting information here that you can also uh, share with the marketing team and reflect with them, see if, uh, if if they, they would agree or if there is something uh, that they would have done differently. And you can explain why your model says that. Right, so the next step is to do that with the decision tree. So we'll use the grid search the same way. So here I don't wanna type the whole thing. So I'm just gonna move to the solution. So we're going a bit faster. 
on this part. Decision tree, Oop, I'll just copy paste that here. So I'm just training the grid search on the decision tree instead and I'll check the best parameters and what we care about the most is to actually interpret it. So copy the one below as well. So now I've trained my decision tree, I can get the best model and here compute its performance. So let's see how well our decision tree is doing. So that's already a bit better than our, yeah. So the contribution is, is, yeah, it's really model specific. So here for the logistic regression, the contribution will be the, like, the weight multiplied by the, um, by the actual value. So here, well, the value is one, so the, the, it's the weight basically. Oh no! So yeah. So here, this is model specific. So you won't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't compare two models uh, with with those values. Well, other methods that we'll see later actually allow you to, since they are model agnostic, they they, they give you uh, things in the same unit every time. But here, no, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't compare two models. So back to our decision tree. Again, we want to call Eli five show weight. To explain it, so I passing, I'm passing the decision tree model and I need to pass feature names equal all features. And here we are. So that's what my model um, seems to care about. And that's where uh, things are starting to be a bit disappointing. So if I compare that to the result I had before for my logistic regression, well, it's less good because this is only a feature importance. It's only giving me um, amplitude of how important relative, relative to each other those features seem to be, but it doesn't actually tell me in which direction. So here you see that I don't have anything in, in red. It just tells me that the, what seems to be the most important for my decision tree, decision tree is the number of days between two contacts, uh, but that's, that's all I know. I don't know if I increase the number of days. Is it better? Is it worse? Um, I don't get this information. The, the best thing that uh, I can do is the decision tree here is probably just plotting it, assuming that my tree isn't too complex, which here it's starting to get a bit complex, uh, but that's probably the best I can get in, term of, uh, in terms of interpretability. So that's a bit disappointing. Uh, and in fact, it's, it won't stop here. Like when um, the decision tree is probably the last model that I can s keep visualizing, but then when we have, if you remember, we, we have the random forest coming next, we have the XGBoost, mo the light GBM model coming next, so those ones will not be able to, uh, to in interpret them at all. So that's why we're introducing another method that is um, model agnostic, which is the permutation importance, and that we discussed before. So to use the permutation importance, you import it first from Eli5, and then you just instantiate it. So if I do perm equal permutation importance, you check the features that it takes. So here, first, um, the first thing it needs is the actual model that I want to interpret. So here, my decision tree model, uh, my decision tree model. Um, and something else that I want to specify by default scoring will be accuracy. Here I want to make sure it computes the balanced accuracy, right? Because my data is imbalanced. So I'll just do balanced accuracy. And that's that's gonna be my uh, my permutation importance object. Then I call I fit it on the test set. Oh by the way, something I haven't mentioned yet is here, all my explanations, I will do it with using that test set or that validation set or like whatever is not the train set. Uh, the reason why I'm doing that is because I want to know how my model um, works when it's generalized on some new data. So I don't want to know how it's mapped 
the training set and it learns something from the training set. What I want to know is that if I put this model in the wild, how will, how will it behave with some data it hasn't seen before? So that's why here, all my interpretation, I'm doing it with the test set. So I'm calling permutation importance, I'm fitting it, and now I've got um, the object trained. So I've done that. And I'm ready to pass it. So if I just do show weight, and I pass it, and again, I'll need to do feature names equal all features. And here, that's the information it provides to me, right? So as we said before, what it's doing in the background is that it's just shuffling each feature one by one and seeing how that impacts the, the, final, uh, the final outcome. And then it's able to tell me how, in terms of amplitude, how, how all those features um, like had an impact on the, uh, on the predictions, on the quality of the predictions. Um, so again, it doesn't actually tell me the direction in which the feature um, contributes, so it doesn't tell me if it helps. So like here, the fact that uh, the person was contacted on the phone, it doesn't tell me if it's better to contact them on the phone or not, but it uh, at least tells me that this contacted them on the phone is important. Um, the month of June seemed to be important as well, the number of days we've seen before uh, the age, and then all those features here seem to be relatively uh, not important, right? And again, since this, um, since this method here is completely model agnostic, you can use it on any, any model. So if you've got a neural network, if you've got the random forest or the XGBoost like we have later, you can, uh, you can just call it on that. Um, here, I think I'm gonna skip that part just to make sure we've got enough time to do everything. But if you were to go through the following steps, we're just training Let's check in the, in the solution. So we're just training the random forest the same way we're getting the output of it and we're training the light GBM model. Same thing in the same way and we're just comparing um, the, the feature importance for those different models. So here the takeaway is really use Eli5 if you've got a white box model and you want to just try to visualize a bit, uh, a bit more nicely either local or global explanations and share that with, with some people, that's great. Uh, if your model happens not to be a white box, uh, you'll have to use something like permutation importance that gives you only some feature importance with only amplitude for each feature, but then you can compare different models and see what they seem to care about um, at global level. Any question about this uh, Eli5 permutation importance? this notebook? No? Great. Okay, yeah. Right, so the permutation, did um, it only sub out one feature this time? Yeah. It seems limited, right? Like yeah, it's, so it, it just wants to know how each individual feature contributes just on its own. Like, so it has no notion of uh, how, um, how it would interact with other features or anything, just. It seems like the more complex your model is, like the less useful that information is because you're, or like the likelihood that there's some type uh, Because they can map, yeah. Patterns is like yeah. higher. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that is like probably the simplest uh, method. We'll see an, another library called SHAP that actually has, is more interesting for, for what you're saying. It can uh, look at all the, um, uh, the kind of the marginal contribution of a feature based on all the other features it's linked to. So it's, okay. it's, it's gonna be better. Okay. Uh, but for now, that's, that's what we've got. And yeah, that's not great, but it does the job. Uh, and then gives you some first, so maybe that's where you'd start and like start uh, uh, debugging a bit your model and see what, um, what you can get out of it. Great. Um, so with that in mind, uh, will, so that's, th that's good, but what the main limitation that we've seen is that if, you, if you've got something, uh, if you've got a model that is a bit more complex, you'll only be able to see the global explanation of your model and not local. So the, new li the, the other library we'll see, we'll see, called Lime, allows you to um, 
is both local and modal agnostic. So it will allow you to explain a single prediction in your, um, from, from your model. Um, so that's the local aspect, but for any, any model. So here we actually don't care at all if it's random forest and neural network or anything. It treats the model really as a black box and it can tell you how important each feature is. So here that's um, it's a diagram that I stole actually from the, uh, from the paper, Why Should I Trust You?, which is the, the paper that was released with the library Lime and written by the authors of Lime. Um, and so that, that explains a little bit um, what's going on. So here the idea is that we've got a model um, so that's ugly thing here with arbitrary complexity and at the same time we've got a row, a single observation with some information here. Uh, that's the case like for, for hospital again with a patient, that ha a patient that has multiple symptoms. So the person uh, sneezes, we've got the age of the person, we know that the person doesn't have any fatigue um, and our model predicts that this person has a flu. Great, so that's the modeling part of it. Then where uh, Lime comes to play is that it trains something that it will call an explainer, and we'll see later what, uh, what that is exactly. And the explainer is able to, to give you something like that. So that's a bit similar to what we've seen with the visualization in, um, in Eli 5. So it tells you that the fact that that specific person sneezes or has a headache uh, will contribute and contributes towards uh, predicting that the person has a flu, whereas the fact that the person doesn't have any fatigue uh, contributes negatively to that, uh, that prediction. So then when I go with that to whoever is taking the decision, so here a doctor uh, will say, well, that's what the model seems to care about and that's why the model predicted that the person has a flu. What do you want to do? Uh, do you want to investigate a bit more? Do you want to um, give a treatment to that person? Do you want to maybe tell us that we should build a model again because it's not good. All those, uh, those outcomes are possible. Um, so how does that work? So this is um, the most simplified version of how, how it works. And again, that's um, something that is used in the, in the paper. So it's not exactly how it works, but I think it gives the intuition. So let's start, uh, let's start with that. So here the idea is that we have uh, a model that is really complex, really not uh, linear or simple, and it predicts two different classes. So the class in blue, a class in is that red or orange. Um, here, so you see that you, we've got two different features. We've got x1 and x2, and your your prediction, if you're here, let's say that you've got the flu. If you're here, you don't have uh, you don't have the flu, right? So that's a really complex model. Um, and we also have a single observation that we want to explain. So here this observation is the red cross that you can see here. Right, so provided with that, Lime will be in charge of explaining how X1 and X2 interact and, uh, and, uh, and can be used to, uh, to explain this, this prediction. So here, by the way, the model has predicted that this single observation is in the red zone, so I think I said it's no flu, or is it flu? Forgot what I said. Um, so with that, um, with that, the first thing that Lime does is sampling uh, a new fake data set around the observation. So it will, uh, it will take this observation and create a lot of points all around it, so that's all the points that you see here. Uh, and for all those points, since we've got the model, we can also generate a prediction. So we've got, um, we're sampling all those points here. We call uh, the predict from our model and we know that those are in the, zone, in the blue zone. Uh, we can sample all those points here. We know that they're in the red zone. Um, and then once we have all those points, we weight them according to their distance to the, um, to the prediction that we uh, are interested in. So here we only care about this prediction here. So surely those points that we've created around there aren't that relevant to explain what's going on here, whereas those points here and here are really relevant. So those will have a larger weight, those ones will have a um, smaller weight. And then the, the, the next thing that Lime does is just fitting a linear regression on those, uh, on those points by taking into account the weights 
Uh, and that linear regression here will be your approximation of your model in that local, uh, in that local area. So we, we're basically assuming that the model could be approximated by something linear in that area. We're actually fitting the linear model, and we're using that to explain the specific, um, the specific prediction. So here, if, we, if I'm using this line then to explain what's going on around here, I can explain that around here, uh, X1 seems to have really, um, like a, a certain impact and X2 has a, a certain impact as well. So I'm using the weights of this to uh, explain what's going on there. Yeah. Um, so it's not necessarily overfitting, or uh, um, it's more a notion of so first thing how it actually samples those points. So it knows the distribution of uh, of all the points from the training data over x one. So it just samples from that and uh, knows like it, it's trying to build a new fake data set that uh, is representative of your training data over x one over x two creates all the points and then it generates predictions out of it. But I don't think overfitting would be the word, the, the word here because that's, that's exactly what we're trying to, we want to understand how our model works. So we're generating predictions from our model and then we fit a simpler model that explains it. Is it kind of like we're saving data on that particular Yeah, you could, s you could see it like that. So we, we're trying to say that in that local area, our model could be seen as almost linear, and then we fit a linear model there that is supposed to approximate it. Right, so if everyone gets the intuition that it's already, um, already pretty good, uh, turns out it's not exactly what's going on. Uh, so I've got next slide to explain a bit um, into more details what's going on. The reason why it's not what's going on is because uh, we're not working with binary, uh, uh, binary outcome, so either blue or red, here we're working with probab probabilities. Uh, so instead of your model is 100% sure that uh, the prediction is red or the prediction is blue, instead of that, your model will always predict probabilities of being in one or the other. Uh, but then probabilities are a bit harder to show in two dimensions, so I've, um, instead I'm, uh, I've done another plot with one single dimension. So here, Let's say that we've got one single feature, then super simple, simple model, which is the age of a person. And let's say that based on the age only, so imagine there would be much more features than that, but here to simplify only the age, your model is able to predict uh, the probability of, of the person uh, having a specific disease. So on the y-axis here, that's your, um, that's your probability of having a disease, so between zero and one. And there the age goes from zero, oops, from zero to 80. So let's say we've got a first uh, prediction that we want to explain. So we're like, this person is 20 years old, and my model predicts that they have 20 uh, percent, um, 0.2 probability of, uh, of having that specific disease. So I'm asking, well, can you explain why do you think this person has this specific probability of having the disease? So then, as I mentioned earlier, Lyme will um, generate new points weighted by the distance from the observation. Um, around that axis here, and it will use the model itself to generate predictions, right? So it's, it's sampling different values of the age, and then for each value of the age, it's able to use the, your model that you're trying to explain to predict the probability. So here, age equal, I don't know, 25 or something like that. I can use your model to predict that it gives you this, uh, this specific probability. Here, I've sampled age 60, where it looks like the model has a higher probability for this specific age. So I end up with a data set a bit similar to what we've seen earlier, where I've got uh, points associated to a probability. Yes? Is it generating new points, or is it sampling from the training It's data? generating new points. Okay. So, so yeah. It might be out of scope, but how does it, how does it sample data? Oh, so, yeah, so that's what I was saying earlier. So the, um, um, it, learns from the training data the distribution of points over age. So it has actually a learned distribution of, uh, of 
how how your points look like on on the on the axis edge. Then it samples from that new points and it's able to generate prediction using your model. So it's kind of sim maybe you can see it as it's simulating your model in that area to see like how mo your model seems to work in that area to create a data set that it can then use to fit a li linear uh, regression there. Um, and once it's get that, it's able to just fit a line at this uh, at this locality, and um, and that line will have um, specific weights, and those weights will be used for the uh, for the explanation. So here you can see that if I'm using lime on this specific point, on this specific data set, uh, it will learn that the, the weight associated to age at around age 20 seems to be quite uh, quite low. So it will tell me here that uh, the age doesn't seem to be such an important feature for this specific um, for this specific observation. Whereas if I had something like that, so maybe around age 70, when I sample all my points, the probability seems to go all this way. So when I fit a linear model in that area here, the weight on for the feature age in that in that local space is much higher. So it will tell me for this observation, age doesn't seem to matter so much. It's almost flat. For this observation, age seems to matter a lot. And that's exactly the kind of explanation I want. I want to know, well, for this person, it seems that age is the, the main reason why we think they have this disease. For this person, we don't think age is that relevant. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah? Cool. So that is pretty much how Lime works. There's a little bit more to it, uh, which is better described in the algorithm here. So the first step is that for a specific observation, we're actually not asking to explain the observation. Use yeah. So is this sampling from a multivariate distribution, or is part of the other variables? The no, yes. Yeah, so it's got the, the over all the the distribution of all the all the features together. Uh, it's yeah. So. The, um, the only thing that was missing in this, in this explanation is that we don't actually, because um, you've got to imagine that your model potentially will have 100 features, and if, I'm, uh, if I give you an explanation with 100 features, uh, that will be much harder to interpret. So the way Lime works, actually, when, whenever you're, you're calling it, you're providing it a model, you're providing it an observation, but also how many features you want to use in your, um, in your explanation, so like, how what are the top, how many top features do you wanna do you wanna return, and then from there the way the way it does it, so it creates the new data set as we've uh, as we've discussed, then it create it calculates the distances between the points to be able to measure the similar similarity, so what points we're gonna care about, what points we're not gonna care about, uh, then it's gener it predicts the probability of the points, and here the number four is the thing we didn't mention earlier. It's using some feature selection technique in order to select only M features. So if you're asking, explain the model using only three features, it will select the top three features first and run the linear model on those, um, uh, on those three features only. Right? So it's got an extra step of feature selection to reduce your, the dimensionality of your data first, and then it fits the linear model, and then it gives you the explanation, yes. Yeah, so it's, it's actually doing something like lasso before or like other feature selection technique to, uh, to reduce the dimensionality and then it trains, uh, it trains a normal linear model on it. Uh, so it doesn't do linear regression in the, uh, it doesn't do regularization in the last step. Um, and yeah, so, um, so what you've got at the end is, is weights on the different features, on the top M features that you're interested in. Uh, so how it looks like in, in practice when you're using it, uh, so you'll, it will give you something like that where the plot at the left corresponds to the actual probability that you, um, you predicted. So here for this specific sample, and again I'm using the breast cancer uh, data set, so here it predicted class zero with probability of 80, um, of 0.8, sorry, and here on the right, um, you see the, 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 uh, the importance um, of each feature, and that's the part we, 
interested in here is the, uh, the explanation of how each feature contributed to that outcome. So here we see that everything in blue will predict, will um, contribute to the probability increasing for the class zero. Whatever I've got in uh, orange here contributes to this, the, to push it on the class uh, one. So you have to see it as like features push your, your prediction on one side or another uh, for the binary classification here. Um, and then something else to note is that for categorical features, it's being a little bit funny. For categorical features, sorry. For numerical features, it's being a bit funny. It's just that um, since your outcome will be a linear model, um, to, to see the actual contribution of a numerical feature, you'd have to take the value, the actual value of that, uh, of that feature is multiplied by the weight, which means that it becomes really hard to compare, uh, to compare contributions of different, uh, of different features together because you wouldn't have the weight only, but the value multiplied by the weight. That means that um, if you've got a value that is negative multiplied by a weight that is negative, it will end up contributing to your model positively, which makes it harder to interpret that on, on the plot. Um, so what Lyme decided to do is that to make sure that all the weights are easily comparable, let's say we'll discretize your, um, your numerical values into different bins. So here, for example, I've got the worst texture, which is supposed to be a numerical value. It will say, well, if worst texture is in the box higher than 25 uh, and smaller than something else, then it's got this specific weight and it uses a dummy value to it. So that means that the weight is actually just multiplied by one for each feature, uh, which makes it like directly comparable. So here you'll say the interpretation of, of this graph is that the fact that, the, and it's a shame we don't see the, the end here, but the fact that the mean radius is between 13 and some other value um, has this exact impact on your, uh, on your final outcome. The fact that the worst area is between this value and this value has this exact impact here, right? Does that make sense? So that's the kind of graph you will be able to see with Lyme. And again, that explains only a local, um, a local prediction. Lyme can also be used on images. So here we've seen tabular data only, but if you've got, uh, say, some, uh, some fancy neural network that can classify images, um, you can apply a line to it. So what it will do is that it will first divide your images into what it calls super pixels, which are just larger areas that contain multiple pixels. And then it will, um, it will gray out some of the areas and same thing, um, like create multiple new images with some of the, so each area will be a feature and so like changing some of, uh, of the blocks and see how, um, how that affects everything. And then it gives you some output like this. So for example, this is a frog. Uh, it tells you probability of point, um, 54 of being a frog, and that's what is associated to this prediction. So that seems to be looking at the head, seems to be the most important feature uh, to predict that this is a frog. Um, <clears throat> it also has a really small probability of being uh, just a bull, and that's those are the, the parts in the image that it looks at to actually predict that. Uh, so here you see that the eye actually looks like it could be a ball, so uh, it predicted it based on that. And an air balloon as well, so it looks like the heart here might be seen as, a, as an air balloon. So we'll do that later, and if you remember at the beginning when I was showing the pictures of the, the husky and the wolf, that's basically the technique that was used to, to show that, oh, you just have a snow detector here. Um, so some drawbacks of Lyme. So first thing, it depends on the random sampling at the beginning of the new points. So it can be it can be unstable. Like you might want to run Lyme multiple times before you actually believe the um, the, the the explanation that it gives you, because you could just be uh, happen to have sampled some points uh, that are not representative, and then the explanation isn't great. Yes. How would you report that? How do you mean? I mean, it, it kind of commits itself to run it several times. 
Yeah, so if you run it several times, then if it keeps, if it keeps giving you the same uh, explanation, because like every time it gives you, it tells you what features seem to be important, what feature is not important. Uh, so if it always tells you the same thing, you start having more confidence. Uh, if it changes every time, well, maybe you don't trust it so much. Um, yeah, and then it also happens a lot that um, your linear model will be inaccurate because the, the assumption here is that your model can be approximated locally by your linear model, which is not always the case. So uh, the good thing is that you can actually check the R squared and see what's, how good your model, your local approximation is, but um, it will often be quite um, inaccurate. It's also quite slow sometimes, in particular with images, because it needs to generate a bunch of data, then call your model to predict on all those points and then fit a, fit a model. Um, just before we, we dive in the notebook, uh, a few available explainers. So Lime works really well with tabular data as with, uh, so like just all the, that's what we, we're gonna do, like everything that fits in the spreadsheet. It has also an explainer for time series. Um, it has an explainer for images and for text. For text, it's, it's quite nice actually that <coughs> if you check the repository, Lime, it's got an example where it's, uh, it has read some images and it can predict um, I forgot what it predicts, but it predicts some characteristic of the person who sent the email based on some words that it picks in the data and it's able to highlight uh, this. The fact that the person used that word means that they're probably X or Y. Um, and then in terms of the API, so it looks quite similar to what we've done with the permutation importance. So first you'll need to uh, instantiate your explainer, so whatever explainer you choose to use with your data. So that's when it actually learning the, um, the, the distributions of, um, of the different features. Then you pick an observation that you want to explain and you call explain instance on your explainer. Uh, here you provide the observation. Instead of providing the whole model, you only need to provide the predict function. So um, that's because Lime is completely model agnostic, so you don't even need to stick to some scikit-learn model here. Whatever function you create that can generate prediction, Lime can use it to, um, to approximate it. Uh, and then you also pick the number of features you want it to use. And finally, you'll have um, multiple functions. So you've got one. The main one that we're gonna use today is show in notebook that just shows uh, a bit, that, that shows the graph that we've seen earlier, so this one. Uh, and then if you want to show the pictures the same as we've seen for the frog, you'll call the function get image and mask, which returns exactly that. And we'll see that in the notebook as well. So it is time for the break. Um, and then after the break, we can go through the, the notebook. Apparently the snacks are going quickly, so you might want to run if you want. Do you know how long the break is? 20 minutes. 20 minutes? Okay, cool.
images or like I don't like know. The, like not I don't work much with images, so yeah. uh, it's mostly like all mostly the example is probably what you were like for example. Right, right, right. Even for example, I find my audience uh, okay. 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 Uh, and we'll actually turn the most of our images into the main image and now if you run it several times it will just say different images. Yeah, okay. So yeah, okay. it's quite harder to
because let's look at here. Oops. Oh, that doesn't work. No, that doesn't work, okay. No, the podium's not a... Uh, uh, so which one should I use? Oh, he didn't. Okay. And that works. Yeah, yeah, cool. yeah, yeah, all good. Thank you Sorry very much. About that. Yeah, the programs aren't. <laughs> all right. All right. So let's let's take another twenty minutes to look at this notebook, and then again we'll go through it. Together, so that's for uh, that's for Lime this time. Um, so just maybe we can just get started together. So it's basically doing all the same steps we did at the beginning to train the model, just quicker. So we can you can just run that, nothing new. We're doing the train test splits. We're creating the preprocessor. Then we're training all the we we preprocessing the data. Then we are training all the models. So we're creating the logistic regression. Decision tree, random forest, light GBM, and here we are. So at this, you can just execute all the cells quickly up to this point, and that's where things are starting to be fun, uh, where we're actually using Lime. So then it will ask you to create a new explainer and start playing a bit with it. So let give you maybe yeah 20 minutes um, to take a look on your site. Yeah, for those of you that are using Colab um, to run it, there's just one thing. So I forgot to I forgot to add help us dot, the, the help us dot py fi file that you see here to Colab, um, which is used only for the Lime notebook. It's like I, I just created a, a function that does some ugly stuff uh, with the column names just to um, uh, to properly like handle the data sets. Um, so the easiest way if you're using Colab, if you're not using Colab, you're fine. Uh, you've got everything in the repo. If you're using Colab, you might want to copy paste that function here in the helpers.py and just add it to the top of your file. Uh, what it's doing? Um, sure. So it's, in, I mean, it, it's going to be explained later in the notebook, but uh, basically Lime is, is expecting your categorical features to be um, with in, integer labels. Uh, so there is a lot of like just boring stuff that you've got to do to change them to integers and then change them back to strings, which I don't think it's the most important part of this tutorial, so I provided a helper function for that. Um, but yeah, so if you're using Colab, you going to have to copy paste that in your notebook just to make sure you, you can access it later down. Cool.
All right, should we, should we go through it together? Um, and you can stop me if you have questions. Right, so um, the first step is to import what we need. So here we'll need the tabula explainer because our data is just a CSV normal table. Um, so that should be fine. Um, then just something um, as uh, an introduction to Lime. Uh, so if, you, if all your values are numerical, that's great. Everything works, works fine. Everything is super easy. That's, that's perfect. Uh, if you have categor categorical values, everything is a bit more complicated with Lime because um, it's, exp so first thing, your model will rely on uh, probably having some one-hot encoded features, so like some dummy values. So your, the data that your model is expecting will not, uh, will not have one single column per, per, um, per categorical feature, but instead, whatever, how many features you have, how many values you have there. So that's one thing. On the other side, Liam expects you to, whatever, um, whatever format your, um, your model expects, Liam wants you to pass your, uh, your categories grouped under the same feature. So it expects, it, it expects you to pass something quite similar to the original data set where you've got uh, job and you have a list of all the jobs. So that means that whenever we're actually working with Lime, we'll need to, um, to write kind of a custom function that does the prediction. So first, it automatically converts this data uh, so with one single feature into, it, it creates the dummies on the fly um, in the predict function and then it, uh, it calls your model on that, right? So you'll need to create that function, which is what we're doing a bit later. Um, but on top of that, it's even worse than that because um, Lime doesn't want you to have, for example, the job as a string, but instead it needs to be an integer, integer label. Uh, so there is even more, um, more work to do. So that means that every time you want to work with Lime, you'll have to pass it a data set where you've replaced all your string values for the categories by integers, and then whatever function you want to explain, so your predict function, you'll have to write a custom function that converts those integer labels to string, uh, string labels, then applies the one hot encoded on the string labels and pass that new data set, that, 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 pre that process data set to your model in the, in the format that it expects. <laughs> uh, so there's a little bit of work to do. Uh, that's why I'm passing um, that helper function there that is doing just that for you. Um, but then, once you have that set up, Lime will take a bunch of, um, of information, so you'll need to pass it while well, your data sets, then the mode, so whether you're working with classification or regression, uh, you'll need to pass it the name of features that you've got so that nothing Nothing special here, but then you'll need to specify also um, first what's, what are the cate categorical features in your data set so Lime can process them differently, and also what are um, the names associated to the categorical features, so what's, uh, what values it, it maps to. So for example, job can be uh, whatever, engineer uh, or whatever. Uh, and then, it's got this last parameter that we've discussed where, um, and that it's recommended to use to have a, uh, an interpretation that is easier to, uh, to understand, which is to discretize your continuous values into different bins so that each of them is treated as a, uh, like a dummy value with only zero or one, and then the weight itself can be used as explanation. So that's a short introduction to working with Lime. And now we can get started. So the first thing we do is exactly what I was explaining. So you can take a look at this code or just the outputs. It's not that important, but it says that your first, uh, your first categor categorical feature here that would correspond to, um, to the job uh, can take all those values. The second one can take all those values, etc. cetera. So you, that's the format of, um, of the dictionary you need to pass to Lime. So just something you've got to keep in mind. Once you have that, I'm also importing 
that function that I mentioned earlier that I've defined actually above, where I'm, uh, I'm basically converting something which has strings as, uh, as values to something that has integer as values. Um, so that's not the most important part of this tutorial, so I'm just gonna go through it quickly. Uh, but yeah, I think you can just anticipate that if you're working with lime and categorical values, it might be a bit of a headache, at least at first, but once you've got it set up, it should be running again. So just here, take a quick look for sanity check. Uh, it looks like it has done the transformation properly. So if I call this function convert to lime formats, my data set, and I give a list of what categorical features I've got, it properly changes, changes it to, um, to actual numerical values, to integer labels. So that's good. So once I've got that, once I've got that sorted, I can create a new tabular explainer. So what I'll need to pass to that is first thing, oops, the training data. So here the training data, again, I need to convert it to, um, to the Lime format, so I'm gonna use my function. Um, so I'm gonna use actually exactly that. So that's the, that gives me the data set converted to Lime format, so I'm gonna use that. Maybe I'll create an, no, I'll just do it directly. So, oh. so that's my data set here in the right formats. Then the second thing I need to provide is going to be the mode. So the mode, I'm working with classification here. What else do I need? Damn it. Yep. Then I will need to specify the feature names. So here the feature names will be, feature names will be equal to all features, right? I've got my list of features already. No, that's not true. That's gonna be my X train columns, right? I need to provide the, the name of the features in the format I provi I'm providing to, to Lime. So that's the one before it was processed uh, without, the the, without the one hot encoded features. Then categorical names, this will be our, um, our dictionary that we created above that we just called categorical names, and then categorical features. Categorical features will be the keys of that, right? That's, if you check that dictionary that we created, the keys correspond to the index of the categorical features, so that's what I want there. So this will be categorical names dot keys. And then I'll set random state to let's say 42. All right, so I think that is not working, okay. Which one? Oh, right, yeah, because it needs to be a NumPy array as well. Great, that works. Um, and I need to assign it to something, so I'll call it explainer. Right, so here what's the was the takeaway? Well, Lime works, but it takes a bit of wiring stuff together uh, before you actually have it working. So it's not necessarily super nice here, and it has a lot of assumptions, like it needs to be a NumPy array with integer, uh, in, uh, integer labels, etc. But once you've got it working, it should be fine, and you shouldn't have to do it over and over again, hopefully. So we've got our explainer ready. Uh, it has learned all the the distribution it needs um, to be able to uh, to sample data and everything. So we're quite happy with that. And now we're just <laughs> selecting a single observation that we want to explain. So again, I'm using the same observation, i equal four, and that's the same person. Um, so age 27, same university degree, blah, blah, blah. Campaign, we contacted them four times. That's the same thing. Great. So now we can see the predicted probability for each of the models. So probably not gonna go through all the models here, but let's say I'm gonna use my random forest and I do predict, predict probability on that and I called it observation. How did I call it? 
x observation, right? So those, um, that would be the prediction from my random forest, right? And I could, I could do that with any of my models and get the prediction. So it looks like all my models are able to predict quite well uh, with a high probability that this person will subscribe to the plan, which is what happens, so uh, seems pretty good. Um, now, I've got this observation again, since I'm gonna ask Lime to explain it, and Lime expects my categorical features to be lab um, integer labels, I have to use this function again to convert it. So here I'm doing just that, converting this, um, <coughs> this, this feature into the right format for Lime, where everything is a number. Then I'm ready to, I mean, oh, I'm almost ready to go. So the last, um, the last step, remember how Lime actually doesn't take directly a model, but it takes, um, it takes a function that generates prediction. So here I'll need to create for each of my model, I need to create a new function that generates prediction. If you're using, um, if you wouldn't have any cate categorical features, you could just do dt model dot predict proba and pass that directly to Lime. Um, turns out that here it's not that easy because we're using categorical features. So what Lime will provide to our function is the data in its own format with integer labels. So I need to convert that to, uh, to something that has the string labels. Then I need to call the preprocessor. So that's what I'm going, so that's what I'm doing here. So first I take whatever Lime gives me uh, as X. I'm converting that to the original format, then I'm transforming that to add the uh, dummy features with the preprocessor that I have trained already, and then I'm returning my probability, right? So here I'm creating a bunch of functions that for each of my models, so logistic regression, decision tree, random forest, like GBM, will generate, will predict probability given some data in the format that Lime has access to. Right, are you all following? Great, um, so once I've got that, now things should be easier. So I'm just gonna call explain instance on my explainer and I need to pass the row. So here the row will be my observation and then whatever function I want to explain. So here let's say I want to explain my, let's do the most complicated one. So the light GBM and I want to specify as well how many features I want my solution to have. So let's do five, I think. And I need to create, to save that in an object. And now I've got an explanation object that I can, uh, that I can visualize. So I think it's the next step. Yeah, that's here. Then whenever I call show in notebook on my specific explanation, it gives me the graph that we've seen uh, earlier, so here I've got the, the prediction that my model did, and most importantly, I've got the, the explanation right here. So here it says that um, the fact that the month is equal June seems to be the thing that contributed the most to my uh, to my model uh, to, to my prediction. Sorry, the fact that the person was contacted uh, via phone seems to be important as well, uh, and again. So we're seeing some consistency here. That's, that's quite nice, I guess. Like Eli5, if you remember, was telling me that the fact that we contacted that person too many times so that the campaign is the number of times I've con contacted a person. So here it's telling me that the fact that we've contacted them more than three times actually played against me and decreased the probability of the person subscribing. Yeah. Um, so I think the data set, the way the data set was constructed is that uh, mm -hmm. uh, campaign is how many times you've contacted the person before they, they actually subscribe to the plan and then we've got the outcome, either they subscribed or they didn't subscribe and then that's, that's it, end of the story. We don't, uh, we don't keep collecting data after that. Um, right, so that's good. So that gives you a local explanation of that. Um, then you might want to try it again 
multiple times with different seeds and see if, if that has an impact or if it gives you the same prediction over and over again uh, to know if you trust it. Also to, to get more confidence in that, um, in that kind of approximation, you can look, uh, you've got access to the actual weights of your, um, of your model. So here I can get the intercept, I can get the exact weights that are associated to each. So if you check, um, if you check here, for example, it says feature seven has a weight of 0.153 something something, uh, which I don't know why it was rounded to 0.16, but it was. Um, so that's that's this one here. Oh no, that's this one. Wait, where is the 16 then? Oh, it's here. It's the first one. Sorry. Just blanked, um, right? So it you, you can actually access the, the different weights that has have been associated to each of your features, uh, and the ones that are displayed in this table. You can also access the intercept, which here is an extremely useful. But um, you can also access the R squared of your um, linear regression. So here it's quite it's quite low, but um, you'll, it it will always end up being low because it's a bad approximation in the first place. Um, but at least it gives you some idea of like how good it is compared to other approximations that you might do. Um, pretty cool as well, you can take your explanation and save it to an HTML file if you've got to share that with your colleagues that don't necessarily want to open a notebook. Um, so here I'll call that explanation.html. And then if you just go there, where did I save it? Can't see it there. Is it gonna open? Ah, uh, damn it. Anyway, okay, I'm giving up. Um, anyway, so you can save it as HTML. It saves exactly what you see there. It's just I'm struggling to open it. Uh, I don't know what I've done badly. Oh, it opens it with Visual Studio. Anyway, so the point here is that you can save it as an HTML. It saves exactly that graph here. So you can just put that on the website or share it with. Uh, one of your colleagues that will be able to open it without having all the context around and see exactly this thing, see how all features impact, impacted that specific prediction. Um, so here, that's exactly what we've done. So we're not going to do it again, but you can explain. Uh, actually, that's, that would be interesting to explain different models. So let's just copy paste what we've got above. So here, the same, explanation, showing, I'm just gonna copy paste that as well. Right, so I can check, so here that's my, um, that's the explanation for my logistic, uh, for my logistic, for my gradient boosting function, I can explain my logistic regression here. Uh, so seem to be the same, same features actually that are important, which is a good sign. So it seems that my model are picking up similar things in the data. Um, so the, the fact that the campaign was quite high, uh, the, the number of, um, of times I've contacted the person, and the fact that the month was June seems to be important as well. If I check my decision tree, um, oh, here campaign doesn't seem to be important for my decision tree. Uh, but the month, the fact that the month is June is really important. And if I check finally the random forest for the same thing. So here um, you've got that single framework that allows you to get local explanation of your, um, of your models, but also compare them because they, they will all be in the same unit and you'll be able to see how different features might be important for your different models. And maybe I trust more one of my models than, than the other um, based on that, but at least I'm able to explain them. Um, yeah, any question about that part? So on using Lime on tabular data, um, I think that's, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, especially because of the kind of weighted and closed categorical 
Yeah. Um, so I don't think it does any of that because like here that would be um, like you would do that when you're training your model potentially but then you want the, like whatever units to be the same as the um, like your original data so if you if you're changing the the like your your features themselves, it isn't uh, it isn't going to be in the same units as what you've got originally. So your explanation isn't uh, um, isn't compatible. Basically, it, it becomes inconsistent. So, because wha whatever output it returns, like the weights need to be compatible with the data that your model is expecting. So, if your model is, if if you've actually scaled your data already for your model that you want to explain, then your weights that you return will be compatible to this model. Okay, that makes sense. But yeah. yeah. Uh, more questions about line for tabular data. So here, I th I think it's supposed to be quite straightforward and easy to use except for categorical data where you've got to um, to do quite a bit of work uh, before. And then another cool thing with, with Lime is that you can use them on non-tabular data, for example, on images. So that's what we're going to do here. So we're just loading um, some random neural network, just instantiating it with preloaded weights. Um, so it's, it's been trained on, um, on image nets, so it's already should be able to, um, to predict that this is a token. So I'm loading this image, and I'm just going to check actually that, okay, first I preprocess it. I'm going to check that it predicts properly. Right, so those are the predictions of the, the model I just loaded, right? So it's quite confident that this, this is a token. Uh, 99 point nine 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 uh, and then it thinks for some reason that it might be a school bus um, or animal fish. Do you have a question? Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I forgot where. Yeah, it's some set of it. Yeah. Okay, great. Interesting. Okay, great. And let's let's just do that and hope for the best. Uh, right. So. So where was I? Yeah. So I, we, I've loaded a model. Uh, I've loaded an image, and I've just generated a prediction on that image, and it looks like that model is pretty good. Now what I want to do is use Lime to actually know what it's trying to look at in the data to, to, to make those predictions. Um, so here, I'm going to load the, the explainer for images, so Lime image explainer, instantiating it. Um, then, as usual, once I'm instantiating the, the explainer, I can explain a specific instance and generate an explanation object. So here, same thing, I'm passing the image, I'm passing the, the model, I'm saying how many features I want to return. Um, that's running now. It's a bit slow, so that's what I was saying earlier. Now it needs to actually um, work with many, many images, process a lot of images, um, and then fit a, fit a model on it so it can be fairly slow hope not too slow, so that I can show the output. I don't know if it's going to run on Colab. Have, have someone managed to run that on Colab? Was it, did it kill it before? Or? It no? Quite took quite a while? Yeah. Five minutes, OK. Great. Uh, I, I don't know. I've tried it before. It was faster than that. Um, anyway, so maybe I can explain the, the rest in the meantime. 
So once we're creating our explanation, here you'll have um, a function um, from, uh, from Lime that is get image and mask that you can pass, um, th that you can use directly. Uh, and then here what you need to specify is the first thing is the class that you want to explain. So my model uh, has predicted multiple classes. So that's what we see here. So it's predicted 96, 96 corresponds to the token. This is the first one here. Then it's predicted um, 779. Uh, so that corresponds to the school bus. So here, whenever I'm calling the get image and mask, I'm saying, well, try to, um, to explain why it predicted this specific, um, this specific class and explain this, uh, this specific thing. So that's what I have later. So if I just run that, still not ready. Oh my God. Do you have any questions in the meantime? I really want to show the output because it's supposed to be quite nice. Uh, so I don't really want to skip that, but yeah. Is the num samples argument for the explanation thing, yeah. is that 1,000 just like a ballpark number that normally works? Or is it like yeah, it's the threshold for producing that for C versus keeping it high enough that we don't lose the potential? Um, so yeah, 1,000 1, seems to be the good, uh, good trade-off. It just happens to, to be fast enough. Which isn't great either, but uh, yeah, if you if you go much higher than that, it would just take forever. Okay. Um, lower than that, it starts to be less trustable, I guess. Um, so yeah, but maybe I should have taken something lower here. Um, well, in the meantime, we can take a look at the picture. It's quite nice. Uh, oh, it's done. Cool. Perfect. So let's see. So let's try to generate. So here what I'm doing is I'm saying explain why do you think it's a token. Give me only those features that contribute positively to the outcome. So what, uh, what specific things in the image do you think looks like a token? Uh, and then I'm saying give me five features and hide the rest, right? So here, if I run that, whoo, that's pretty good. Uh, so it tells me that those, those things are what it thinks looks like a token in the image. Those are the five first. So it calls it super, super pixels. So it's some group of pixels um, that, it, that it put together. Right, so let's see now what, um, what happens if I select only one feature. So I'm asking, oh my god, that's disappointing. Um, <laughs> So I'm asking, show me only the top feature, the one that you think is the most important to say it's a token. And here, I would, I would really have hoped they would show the, the beak of the, of the bird, but uh, it shows that. So uh, I guess it tells you that it's not really that reliable. Uh, and like, if you t did you all get that result? Or did, you, did someone get the beak? Because if I run it multiple times, sometimes I have the beak and I'm quite happy. Uh, <laughs> it's on the bird. Yeah. <laughs> true, true. Yeah, <laughs> you need to see the bright side. Um, great, so that's, that's the explanation of why it thinks it's a, let's try two actually, give me two, yeah, okay. So the beak is the second one, it's not so bad. Um, but then I can also ask to explain the other predictions it, it made, right? Like, so like the first, the most likely class was a toucan. It also thinks for some reason it might be a school bus. So, and that's probably more interesting here. So I want to know why, why, would you, why would you think that's a school bus? Uh, and so I can run that. And there it, it tells me, and it's actually pretty good. So here, another thing I've, I've added is that I do positive only false. So that means it will plot in red what it thinks, like put the prediction in the, the other direction. So less likely to be a school, bu a school bus and green what is most likely to be a school bus. And here what it shows is that it, this one actually makes sense. So if you look at it, so it, everything that is basically a token tells me, well, this decreases the likelihood of being a school bus. But this little bit here is what I think might look like a school bus. And if you were zooming on the image a little bit, that's, that's this part here that is a bit uh, 
angle, a bit square. So that, you could argue, maybe, something that I'm, I'm interpreting my interpretation, right? I, please. <laughs> so this, this little bit here, at least that's a way to see it. No, you don't buy that? Yeah, anyway, that's. Yeah, that's a school bus. Anyway, so uh, I guess I guess the, the so Lime is pretty useful to kind of debugging a bit and uh, and try to approximate your model. But yeah, as as we've seen just with those toy examples, it's not extremely reliable uh, either. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know actually. I Wait, so it can't it can't completely hide the pixel, it has to somehow deactivate them in a yeah. way by, by replacing them by some other numbers. Okay. Um, so I think it's it's not actually grey but black. So it's just putting, setting everything to black. So you're really bad at classifying black holes. Yeah, if you've got like different, yeah, like okay. <laughs> that's that's a really good question. <laughs> um, is that what you do? You classify black holes? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, that's great. Uh, yeah, no, that's a really good point. I, um, but I guess, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I kind of want to try it actually, <laughs> just to, just to see if it like if it decreases everything. Uh, but I guess even if you've got your black wall, like you're interested in the parts of lights that are, you, you're not interested in the whole black part of it, right? Uh, so probably it would do something. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, any more questions? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. But so, what, what do you mean by you take actions on it? So, so if I wanted to change my yeah. algorithm based on what I saw here, how would I set up the one So first, you'll need to try to build confidence that what Lime is telling you is true. Uh, so it's I, I see it more as kind of a, a way to point potentials potential errors that you've made, but not necessarily like telling you, hey, this is wrong, fix it right now. So it's more like, if you see that if I'm running Lime multiple times on this image and it keeps telling me that it's another part of the image, that is, like if it would tell me every time, well, here I'm trying to classify a token and it consistently shows the background as the most important feature, I might think, well, maybe there's something wrong with my data set. Maybe I've got only, only pick, like only the, the token is pictured in a jungle or something and then like, it picks the, the background as the most important feature. Uh, and then you go back to your data set and you see if you've got some bias in there. Uh, so that's, that's more like giving you an indication of what seems to be important for your model and then you, you don't necessarily take action directly but you try to explore and like, validate or not this, this thing. So if it tells you the most important here is the background, go back to your, um, go back to your data set, see if there is some bias uh, on like with images mostly with this background or something and you can confirm or not. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it feels like you can obviously a little bit. It seems laborious to print out. Yeah, but, uh, but that's, the, that's the funny thing with interpretability is that you, so you've got your, f first step is you're building a model that you don't necessarily trust that much and then your interpretability is basically a model that explains the model which itself can be not that reliable. So yeah, that's like you always have to kind of iterate and build confidence step by step. Yeah, more questions about Lime? No? Great, so we can see, oh my god, and we've got half an hour, that's perfect, um, for SHAP. So 
the last uh, the last library I want to talk about today is called SHAP. So that's something that came up after after Lime and try to generalize to build a, a framework that kind of uh, generalize all those um, approaches. So here the idea is a bit of what I just said um, a second ago. So we've got your data set, you're building a complex model, um, and you're generating predictions from it. Uh, and then whenever you want to actually explain this model, you'll build um, an explainer. So in the case of Lime, the explainer was um, that linear model locally, and that explainer can be used to generate explanations. So that's the generic framework, the idea. And then what, um, what Shap um, is saying is that basically uh, all, all those libraries like Lime um, and what Shap is doing, what we'll see later, uh, consist in having an explainer that can generate uh, an explanation as a linear combination of all your features. So like every, every sort of um, explanation that you'll get out of, uh, out of Shap or out of Lime is basically a weight associated to each feature, and when you combine all those weights together, that 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 kind of explain the, the final prediction. So that's kind of the, the really generic framework. Now more uh, more in depth, what Shap uh, is trying to do here is that for a given, so it it works mainly as a local um, local explain um, local interpretability model. So for a given observation, what we want to do is compute the Shap values. Uh, and the SHAP values are defined, um, need, need to re, um, follow the following um, um, equation, I guess, um, which is whenever, so you'll have a SHAP value associated to each single feature in your data set. So if you've got age, you'll have a SHAP value for age, and that will correspond to the weights uh, associated to age. If you've got education, you'll have a SHAP value for the education. That will be the weight uh, that will be shown later, right? So those are the weights of your linear combination in here. Uh, and the idea is that SHAP values is basically trying to find the, the, um, the correct uh, weight for each of your single features so that when you're summing all those weights together, they explain the difference between the prediction for that specific observation and the expected value of the model. So just to explain a little bit the terminology here, what we call the expected value of the model is um, the average prediction made by your model. So like um, if, you've got, um, if you've got a data set where you've got 50-50 of two different classes, well, you expe the expected value of your, uh, of your model will be 0.5. So it's expecting that on, uh, by default, if it doesn't do any prediction, it will predict 0.5 for each value. Right? So that's, the, that's kind of the distribution of your uh, training data. That's what your model would predict by default. And then what, we, what we're saying with SHAP is that every, um, every set of features in your, uh, for a specific observation contributes to pushing this, uh, this expected value towards whatever your model ends up predicting for this observation. So here, let's say my expected value is at 0.5 because my data set has 50, 50 of each class. And for this specific observation, I predict, I predict a 0.75 probability of being in the class. Then I've got a shift, uh, a shift from the expected value of 0.25, right? And that's what I'm gonna try to explain with the sharp value. So I'm saying, well, I've got, for this specific observation, I've got a shift from, uh, from the expected value, the average value of my model of 0.25, how do you explain that feature per feature? And then you'll have age maybe contributes to uh, 0.1 in that shift, uh, education contributes to 0.5, et cetera. So it will be able to say how each, uh, each single feature contributes to this, uh, to this shift. So that's the main idea, that's what they want to do. And then the second question is how, how they actually do it. Um, and yeah, here, just to reiterate that the interpretation will be really that the sharp value, so the value for each feature for a specific observation, a specific prediction will tell you how um, each feature contributes to push the prediction the way it is. So how it does that. So from a really model agnostic point of view, and we'll see that later, SHAP actually does more complex things uh, 
under the hood, but if we take the completely model agnostic uh, aspects, SHAP is leveraging something called Shapley values from game theory, which is just a way to, um, to know um, the, the contribution of um, the marginal contribution of something in a set of, um, of, uh, of like features in this case. So the, the main example that you've got is say you've got three, um, three people um, that contribute, um, uh, let's say that contribute some, uh, some money or some skills to, uh, to a team. And what you want to know is like how, uh, how on average each, uh, each person brings, um, brings to the equation, but this person can have skills that overlap with other people. So maybe myself alone, I've got a certain, uh, a certain contribution, so I get a certain score. I'm, uh, I'm that good, that level. Maybe me combined with another person, uh, say we're talking about students and we're doing group projects, so maybe me alone working on a project got a certain grade. Me working with another student, I've got a grade that is slightly better. Uh, me working with two other students, I've got a grade that is even better. How do you know the contribution of each student to that? And that's what Shapley values are in game theory. They basically try to, um, try to see the marginal contribution of a single student. So the, the way to apply that on, on features is that you first get a subset of um, like all the possible subset of features that do not contain a specific feature. So let's say we want to see how important is age for your model. So you first get all the subset of features that do not have age in it, and you try to see how well your model can generate prediction without knowing the age of the person. So that's the first thing. And then you see how, um, how adding the age to each of the subsets Improves the uh, improve the the accuracy of your model, um, and then what you've got to do is just aggregate, average those uh, those contributions over all the sets. So here the idea uh, is a bit different than what we've seen with permutation importance. So permutation importance, we're just taking all the features every time and randomizing one uh, one single column and see how that affects the the output. So we only see. Uh, the impact of one one single column. Here, we're actually observing uh, how adding adding this column to every other possible uh, group of uh, of columns of features impacts uh, impacts the model. So that takes into account what you were um, what you were saying. If you've got some overlap between two features, it will take it into account. Maybe if say you've got uh, with a concrete example, let's say you've got education age and, uh, and job. So maybe adding aid, age to only job has a high impact, but maybe adding age to job and education has really limited impact to your, to your model. So here we'll be able to see it because maybe age and education are, uh, okay, let's do job and education. Maybe job and education are correlated. So adding education to a set of features that already contains job will have a really limited impact, really limited improvement on your model, whereas adding education to something that has only age will uh, improve your model. So here we take every possible subset and we see how adding this specific feature uh, improves it. Mm -hmm. Am I making sense? Yeah. So you have a lot of other features that would be... Yeah. So that is, th that is super expensive computationally, like, because you've got a try every possible subset of features. So if you've got a lot of features, that's a lot of subsets. And then every time add the, the single uh, feature you wanna test for. And that's for every feature. So for every feature that you wanna get the importance of, you have to do that. Right, so does, does it make sense or should I, do, should I do it again? It's fine? Not fine, fine? Yeah, so just to summarize, I, I think the example is actually uh, the most, the, the easiest to understand. So I've got age, education, job. I've got three features I want to see which one is more important. If I were to do, to use the permutation importance, I would just randomize each one one by one and I will know how each one um, is important on its own, uh, which is good, but it doesn't take into account if two features are correlated. So here by using this technique, I've got those three features. I see how, uh, if I take 
only age. So I want to see how important the education is uh, for my model. So if I only have age, I add education to that, I see how that improves the model. If I have only age and job together, I add education to that and I see how that improves my model. Turns out that when I add education to age only, it has a huge impact. If I, had, if I add education to age and job, it has a really small impact because most of the information contains, contained in uh, education is already contained in job. Right? So uh, it, it, it handles that. Yes? So they're not reprinting your model. No, yeah. Your model will expect three variables coming in, let's say. Yeah. So that's the next slide. Uh, so yeah, so if you, if you get that as the first, that's the first step, and then there is this uh, great question, which is, well, here I'm talking, about, um, I'm talking about deactivating features, like trying to, uh, to generate predictions with some features missing. And with, with your model already trained, you won't be able to, f to provide some data with, uh, with features missing. So instead, you need to be able to um, um, to fill whatever uh, whatever miss wh whatever feature you want to deactivate by your default value. So the way Sharp does that, which is um, just um, a kind of choice they've made, is that they they're saying that they, there's this, the same idea of expected value for your features, and we say that. If you're given the distribution of all the features you've got, uh, all the values you've got for a given feature, if you set that to uh, to the average uh, average value of all all the values that this specific feature can take, you're basically saying that you uh, you, you take the central value and you can't. Uh, uh, it's it's like will be a default, and then your your feature can either move higher or lower. So you um, you're setting to deactivate a value, you'll set it to its expected value, to its average on some training data that you've learned. And that will be the default behavior. You'll, you'll see that as your feature is neutral, it's not higher or lower than, uh, than usual, it's just the average. And then when you increase, you can either increase or decrease this value, and that's when you're starting to measure the impact. Right? So missing feature in this case uh, is would be the wrong way to see it. What we're saying instead is that we get average, so like a neutral, uh, a neutral contribution of that feature. Um, and then, so those two things, um, whenever you want to use SHAP, you'll need to provide some training data that it can from which it can learn all this information. So it will need to learn uh, the expected value, so it will need to learn what's on average the prediction of your model. So it's 50-50 if your classes are perfectly balanced, but it can be something different. And it also needs to learn the expected value of each feature, so the average, the neutral uh, version of each feature. And then once it can do that, it can start um, simulating the exact the, the thing we just said, where it's building all the subsets of features, some of them being set to their neutral value, some of them keeping the, the, the value we expect, and then we see the contribution of uh, adding the specific feature we want. But as uh, you mentioned earlier, this is something that is gonna be really um, computationally expensive because that's tons of things to simulate and predictions to generate every time. Uh, and let's say you've got something like a K nearest neighbor, which is really slow to generate predictions. Um, and you need to generate predictions in every subset of the data. So that's gonna be really, uh, really, really slow. So what, um, what SHAP does is that it's got um, some optimized version of that for different models. So for example, for trees, um, we've got here, it will have something called a tree explainer that works only for trees where it's able to uh, learn the expected value instead of just uh, take, learning it from some, approximating it from some training data. It will, learn, it will know exactly the expected value of your model. Um, given by the structure of the tree. And we also know the contribution of each individual feature. It's got uh, an algorithm to actually learn it from every single node in the tree directly without having to simulate it. So it's just a, um, a shortcut. Instead of having to simulate and generate all those, um, like manipulate all those um, 
all the all the data and generating prediction, it will learn it directly by uh, by looking at the different rules, binary rules you've got in your tree, taking the different uh, different values from there and compute directly um, as a closed form solution the the contribution of each feature. So, conclusion of that is, if um, so, SHAP is model agnostic, so you can use it on any any sort of model, but it will be really slow on uh, on a random model. Um, so it has optimization for different classes of models. If you've got trees, you can use um, something called the tree explainer, which will be really fast and will take a lot of shortcuts. So that works with scikit-learn, XGBoost, LightGBM, CatBoost, anything that has trees in scikit-learn way uh, inside. So that's really good because that's all the models we, we've got uh, to test today. Uh, for deep learning, they just released a, uh, a class as well that is able to also, same thing as a shortcut, just directly compute the contribution of each feature without having to simulate it. Uh, but then, if instead your model is completely a black box and you can't, uh, it, it, it's not able to find shortcuts to contribute those, to, to compute those contributions, it will have to simulate it and then that will be really slow. Uh, but if you need to do that, you just import the kernel explainer. So what, um, what does SHAP provide? Um, so that's, that's the output that, uh, that you can get for each prediction that you want to explain. So you'll have, it will display the base val value. So the base value is the, the expected value. So what your model would predict if it wouldn't have any information. So like just the, the default value. So here 0.59 for the specific example. And then the output value is what it actually predicted for this specific observation. So here, from here to here is the actual shift that, uh, that I have for the specific observation. And then SHAP displays nicely how each of the feature contributes to this shift. So it says that this specific feature was concave points contributed, contributed quite a large amount to push the prediction in this direction, so increasing the probability. So this in red here increased the probability quite a bit. The worst radius here decreased the probability, so pushed it on the other side, and then you've got all the features like this. So it's a pretty nice uh, visualization that shows how the features are kind of working together um, to well, like push the prediction on one side or another, uh, which again comes down to, to this, right? Like it's when you're summing the contribution of each single, uh, inch, each single feature through their SHAP values, you'd have the shift from the expected value. Right, so in blue you have the negative SHAP values, everything that pushes um, your prediction to decrease the probability, and in red, increases the probability. Any question about that? So that's SHAP for local interpretation. Um, yep. Uh, so that's because that's going to be your like neutral level. Um, yeah, so that's for local interpretations. Uh, but then the cool thing with SHAP is that you've got um, since you've got contribution of each feature um, to your uh, for for each specific observations. If you plot all the observations together, you can understand how your model uh, works at a global level as well. So here, what SHAP does is that it computes the, this graph for each single, uh, each single observation if you're in your data set. It plots everything together and that shows you the importance of all features. So here what, you, uh, what you're seeing is, and this one is a bit hard to understand at first. So if you see on the x-axis is the SHAP values. So on the left, it's negative on the right, it's positive. So all the points that will be on the left will contribute to push the, um, the, the, the prediction um, negatively. So here we're predicting whether something is cancerous or not, whether a cell is cancerous or not. So everything that is on the left will, um, will, make, will, um, will make the likelihood of something being cancerous smaller. Everything on the right will make the likelihood higher. So that's the first thing. Then it shows every, 
every single feature uh, as a rule like this, so it's similar to the feature importance that we're used to. And then this axis here shows the value. So it's, if it's in blue, it's a small value. If it's in red, it's a high value. So what, um, how do we interpret that then? So here what we can see is that for this specific feature, LSTAT, high values of, uh, of LSTAT, so all, all the things in, in red, seem to, um, seems to, decrease the, um, to decrease the likelihood of a cell being cancerous. So it's like in one single graph, you can already start seeing not only how important, um, how important each feature is, but also in what direction it pushes it. So here looks like for some of the points, the f so some of the points that have a high L stat seem to have a super, super high impact on decreasing the, the probability. So here, that has a really, really small, I mean, highly negative sharp value. So those points here, I might want to look at them, but it looks like the fact that LSTAT was high had a really huge impact on the, the probability being uh, lower. Here, same thing. I've got some points with a really low value and seems to have a really high positive impact on the, um, on the, on the prediction. Yes, you had a question? So, um, so there's multiple levels here. The, the first one is we need to be able to um, to compute the sharp values for a single observation, which for trees happens to be fast. For non-trees, or uh, yeah, for something that is not a tree, and you'll have to do that process. That will be really slow. So that's the first thing. And then you've got to compute a bunch of points, a bunch of observations to be able to generate a graph like that. Um, so maybe dozens of them, uh, which adds another level of complexity. Um, so yeah, that can be quite slow. If you're not using tree, that is gonna be really hard to generate this graph. It will take like hours, <laughs> like <laughs> really. Um, if you're using trees that, and you're limiting it to maybe a, maybe like dozen points or something, that should be doable in a couple of minutes maybe. So here you're literally computing one by one all the all the sh like sharp values on every every observation you give. So yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't understand. What, is there an individual line? What is the width of the um, point that you can like bump? In? The width here. It's, it's so it's just trying to show you the um, uh, how many points are there. Okay. Yeah. So here you so those seem to be potentially outliers, and most of your points seem to be here. Um, so that, this graph shows you a lot of information. Here I see, actually that's a really good point, I see for the DIS feature, so I'm not sure what the DIS is, but what I see here is that there is a big, big chunk of points here that have uh, quite limited impact, so it's pretty much zero sharp value. So all those points here, for all those points, this feature seems to have almost zero impact on my predictions. But then for some outliers that I see here, this feature, DIS, seem to have really high impact, and those points have a low value. So those points have a low value of DIS, and they seem to have, the, the DIS feature seem to have a really high impact on my prediction. Uh, and here, positive impact, that means the, the, the cell is cancerous. So probably I wanna look at those points and see what's going on there. Um, so that, that provides you this information. Same story for the RM here. It looks like a few values that have a high uh, a, f a few observations that have a high value of RM seem to have a really high impact on the on the final prediction here. This this RM feature, whereas most of the points seem to have a low sharp value, like a close to zero sharp value. And then all those features here, so age, and all the other features, uh, seem to have really small impact on on uh, on my predictions because they're all around zero sharp value. All right, so that's how you'd interpret that. Yes? So if you use the average, you define that as neutral. What happens if some of these people are really Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a problem. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just, so that's, that's the assumption here, that because it needs, it needs a way to define missing value. And the way it decided to, to define missing value is just 
giving it a new whatever it calls neutral, and the neutral would be would be the average. So yeah, that's that's a good point. Yes. Um, I don't think I don't think that the implementation allows you to do that. But you, if 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 the problem is really skewed data, you could process your data before trying to uh, trying to explain it. Um, um, yeah. Any questions? So I guess that I don't know how obvious that was, but we we start with like SHAP is a way to explain a local to to give a local interpretation to explain a specific observation. But um, if you plot all the points together, that gives you actually a really powerful global explanation of your model, which is much better than uh, the feature importance that you usually get on trees and, uh, and those things. Uh, just, oh my god. Uh, <laughs> just a quick word on the API. So yeah, you'll, um, you'll build your explainer, you'll compute Shapley values, and. Uh, then you can either use something called force plot to explain a specific explanation a, observation, or summary plot is the second one I see here. And it's time for the notebook. Uh, so how is that going to work? We've got two minutes left, which is not a lot of time to work on a notebook. Um, so maybe I'll just go through it to show you what's going on there, and you can uh, you can take a closer look later. How does that sound? Yeah. So we'll. Load everything first. Here I'm training all my models, the so same thing we've done before. And I'm importing SHAP, and now I'm ready to go. So all the models, like I, I only want to explain the LightGBM model here. It happens to be my best model, so I'll stick to that. So LightGBM is doing boosting with trees. Quite, uh, I'm quite lucky here, because that means I can use the tree explainer, which is fast. Um, and you can try, actually, if you, if you want, uh, you can train a K nearest neighbor model and try SHAP with K nearest neighbor, and you'll see it's really slow. Uh, right, so now I'm selecting the same observation. So we'll, we're really starting to know a lot of, uh, a lot of things about this specific person. Um, and here, my, um, my light GBM model predicted 0.89. Uh, probability of subscribing to my to my plan for this person, right? Cool. So now let's compute the SHAP values. Ooh, you see, it was really quick. Um, so it because it here doesn't have to simulate anything; it just gets it directly. And if I check um, the dimension of this matrix that is written by SHAP value, is a vector with 57 values, right? 57 is the number of features. So here. You don't believe me? That's that's what it gives you. So um, an array with a, a value for each of the each of the uh, the features that you've got. Um, here, just a quick um, a quick sanity check that we that we do. So the the units of the SHAP values that will be returned will be uh, will be in the same unit as the default output of your model. Um, what that means is that if your model predicts probability by default, the value of your SHAP values will be, uh, the, the unit of your SHAP values will be probability. If you're here, it turns out that the light GBM by default uh, returns, um, returns predictions as log odds. So all the SHAP values that I've computed will be log odds. So I just need to, to keep that in mind if I use the, if I use the, the array directly. Uh, what unit that it is in. Uh, so here, just doing some sanity check uh, where I'm generating, so I wanna, basically I'm saying I don't, I don't really trust that, uh, that SHAP, uh, what, what the expected value of SHAP is. So if you click call on your explainer, explainer dot expected value, that's what it is. So here I just wanna prove that the expected value corresponds to, uh, to this, so to what, uh, to the average log odds of, uh, of the predictions of my model. And here, if I do that, it's, it's the same thing. Um, so here, the only thing I've demonstrated is that the expected value is what I, I said it was, uh, which is great. So once we've got that here, just want to prove again. Um, so that's, 
difference between the expected value of your model and um, um, and uh, so here, LGB model dot predict proba is the, the probability uh, that my model predicted. I convert that to log odds to be able to have the same unit as the expected value, and I find a difference of 262. And if I check the sum of my sharp values, it's 262 as well, right? So the sharp values have the, the property that we mentioned before where the sum of them correspond to the difference between the expected value and uh, whatever you predicted. Great, so that doesn't actually tell us much, it just verifies that it seems to be working. Um, so now the first thing you can do is generate an explanation for your, for your single observation, so we'll call false plots on, uh, I need to provide the expected value of my model, so I have it explained that expected value. I need to provide the sharp values that I've computed for the specific observation. Um, I need to provide the, the observation itself, and here, Actually, SHAP is being quite nice with you and giving you a, a parameter where you can choose what unit to display it in. So by default, it will display in whatever unit it is. Here I'm saying, well, can you show it as probability? Because it's probably easier, it's probably easier to, um, to visualize. So here, that's what I've got. Um, so that's quite interesting. So the base value is 0.38, so as a probability. And the output value, so what my model actually ended up predicting for this specific observation is 0.9. Uh, and then it's saying the fact that uh, the number of days is equal to th three seems to be the, the most important thing that mattered for this observation, and it had this big of an impact. And the fact, again, that the campaign so that we called the person four times had a negative impact, and that's how much of a negative impact it had in the final, uh, in the final outcome. Uh, so that's quite an interesting plot. Um, and here is all my interpretation of it. Um, and I haven't got time to, to read that, but the idea is it kind of leads to some questions like, well, that's great. It seems to be like the number of days between two, uh, two, two calls seem to be important. The number of times we call the person seem to be important. What, what happened in June? Is it important as well? So that kind of leads to questions like, first you want to ask maybe to the marketing team, but also you want to explore if those things that are important for this specific prediction are actually important for the model as a whole or not. So that's why we, we want to see some global explanation of that. Uh, so here, it turns out that if you want to do that, you first have to select some observations. So I could do it on the whole data set, but uh, as I say, it's, it's probably going to be slow. So instead, I'm, um, I've only sampled dozen, dozen observations at random from, uh, from that, my data set. I call that observations. Then I compute Shapley values on that. And here, if I check Shap values shape, I've got dozen rows, and each row has 57 uh, values, right? So I've got a Shap value for each feature for each observation. Then I can call false plot. So false plot works if you pass Shapley values for a single observation, but it also will generate something if you call it on multiple observations at once. And that's what it looks like. Um, so that might be hard to read, but basically imagine it as each, each line like this over the y-axis, so like this, corresponds to the red and blue line that we used to see horizontally. Um, so what that is, is that, that's, that here is a single observation, and it, it has grouped the observation that look alike. So here, I've got a big, uh, I've got a bunch of observations, about 100 observations, so from zero, from index zero to 100. 100 observations where the number of days seem to have a really high positive impact on my, uh, on my prediction. So here, all those values seem to have P days uh, with a high shab Shab high positive SHAP value, so pushing my prediction to, uh, to increasing the likelihood of subscribing. So all those points here seem to have that. Then those points here seem to be around 50-50 um, like prediction, so I don't really care much about those. Here I've got points where, again, they, they have a l high probability of subscribing to the plan, so that's the probability that you see here high probability of subscribing to the plan and 
I can't see, but it, it would tell me what features seem to be most important for those points. So it's kind of trying to group them like this. And then you can do all sorts of things like s sorting them by number of days, for example. And here, that's interesting, because I see that um, the, let's do instead, um, let's do age, actually. Age is very interesting. So age, so if I say, okay, sort all my sharp values for all my points by, um, by age, so here you see on the x-axis is the age, so it goes from about like something like zero to 90, um, and it grouped them. So I see that here for age around 20, age around 20, the, I've got a really high chance of subscribing to the plan, and I've got all those features, so here, the, the age itself is actually really important to push the likelihood of, uh, of subscribing to the plan up. So there's a group of people between uh, like maybe 15 and, and oh, that's, that's not the unit, okay, that's not the same one. Between 15 and like around 25 that seem to have a high like you, likelihood of subscribing to my plan and the fact that they are that age uh, seem to be the most important feature here. So that's one group. Then I've got all those people here between the age of 25 and around 60, for which, first thing, they have about like 0.4 chance of actually subscribing to my plan. So those people are actually not interested in my, um, in my plan at all. And like they have multiple features that seem to be pushing it up and down, but not having a, a huge impact. So here it looks like for all those people, the different features that I've got in my data set don't seem to affect the outcome very much. So those guys probably, I want to tell the marketing team, well, for those people, you, you can't really do much. Uh, they seem not to be interested in it. Uh, and then I've got another huge group of people between the age of 60 and 90 uh, that seem to, um, to be really uh, impacted by different features. So here, hard to see. I want to know which one is that. So that's the month is June. Uh, so for some reason, one of the important features that you see in red here seems to be the fact that the month is June uh, and their age as well. So all those, uh, all those things are pushing the, the predictions up. So you're seeing like already two groups of, of customers, three, gr three groups of, of customers. Young people who are likely to buy my plan, uh, people in between that don't seem to care much, and uh, all the people that seem to potentially care a lot. Um, then you can also select, for example, number of days. And here, I can choose only the effect of the number of days. And that's, again, really interesting. So here, that's the number of days from 0 to uh, 1,000. Uh, and I see how the number of days between two contacts seem to impact, uh, seem to impact the, the likelihood of, uh, of subscribing. So here I see that if I, if I don't wait too long between two contacts, I, inc I increase quite a bit the likelihood of, um, of subscribing to, to the plan. So here from 0.4 up to 0.8, pretty much just because of the fact that the number of days is so small. Uh, but here, if the number of days is really high, around here, I see that that, that is having pretty much zero impact on the, on the prediction. So here, if, I, if I'm waiting more than, I don't know, about 600 days, then the number of days end up not, it doesn't matter much anymore. Yeah? So it, could you say then that your customers really are between this age and that age, and you should contact them no more than three times, but no more than 600 days? Like uh, yeah, I mean, if you would, if you would want to jump to conclusion directly, that's probably what you what you would do. But it's more likely that what what you want is to to take notes of those and discuss. Actually, like, does, does that does that make sense? Does it correspond to to your intuition or uh, like what you've seen on the field? Um, and also, one one other interesting feature that I wanted to show is campaign. So, how many times? Uh, how many times? how many times we've contacted the, the people. So here, I can see that um, at, like if I contact up to maybe like about nine times, 
uh, a single person doesn't seem to matter too much. Uh, it doesn't seem to have too much of an impact on the, on the final prediction. But here, it looks like for a lot of people, if I, uh, if I contact them more than, say, 12 times, the, the number of times I contact them seem to be super important and have a super high, super high negative impact on the likelihood of subscribing. So here, I can go to the marketing team and say, well, it looks like if you contact them more than 10 times, it's really being uh, counterproductive and really uh, decreasing the likelihood of the people subscribing in the end, uh, which, again, is some interesting, interesting finding. Uh, so also, I think, and there, there is more that you can, uh, you can explore here by just changing how you want to sort your shape values and how, how you want to filter if you want to show the whole thing or just uh, the impact of a single feature. Um, so if, if you haven't followed the whole interpretation, I've tried to write it down here, so you might want to look at that later. Uh, just to finish with that, summary plot, so the one we've seen in the slides, um, but for, for this specific thing here, so tells you that the contact, the, the fact that you contact people by phone here seems to be quite an important feature. Uh, I'll decrease that a bit. Um, seems to be quite an important feature, so, and it's, perfectly ordered. So it looks like if contact cellular will be zero or one. So it looks like if it's one, it has a positive impact. So I can tell uh, the marketing team, well, looks like all the points for which you've, you've contacted people by phone uh, seem to have, the, the fact that you contacted them by phone seem to have a, a positive impact on the outcome. Whereas all the people that you did not contact by phone, uh, it seems to have a negative impact, and sometimes quite a high negative impact. So at this point here is further than this one. Uh, here, the number of days, that's something we, uh, we've already noticed on the previous graph. So number of days, if it's, um, yeah, if it's, uh, if it's just normal value, it doesn't seem to have much of an impact. Uh, so if the number of days is uh, between, like, I don't know, higher than, than some values. I forgot how, wh what did we say, but if it's too high, uh, it doesn't seem to have an impact at all. Uh, but now, if your number of days is really low, so that will be the color blue, it seems to have a huge positive impact on, uh, on the outcome. So here again, just by looking at that, I can say number of days, if it's low, it has a high positive impact. Then you can see all sorts of things. So you can see campaign is the kind of the, the, the opposite story. Like if I contact people too many times, so here I contacted that person too many times. It looks like it has such a huge uh, negative impact on the, on the final outcome. So here those points are probably outliers, but I contacted them so many times that uh, that ends up being the main reason why they didn't actually subscribe to the plan. So you can see a lot of things like that in this graph. Here, those things don't seem to matter too much. Um, those points here are around zero shape value. Yes, someone had a question. Yeah. Yeah, so. Calling them more isn't going to make them less likely to subscribe. It's just that if you have called them four times and they haven't subscribed yet. Yeah, so that's. that's it. Four times, probably not going to help you at all. So but so that's, a, that's exactly the kind of things you need to, to end up discussing with whoever is the domain expert. Like, instead of just going through conclusion yourself, you're like, well, okay, so that's, that's what seems to, to happen, and that's what I can see in the data, the impact of different things. And then you discuss, like, well, is that something we can actually take action on, or is that something that, as, as you said, that is, is, is just, it's just how it is, and that's, uh, that's we're just seeing a normal impact, and ch changing that will not have, uh, make any, any difference. It's not like they're, they're going to call and they're going to be like, hey, forget it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. So, um, so like, there, there's a big difference between what you see in the data and what recommendations you make and like whether those recommendations will be any useful or not. Um, and then just to finish with that, something that I didn't mention, an extra, extra thing that you can see with, uh, we can do with SHAP is uh, dependence plots. So here, uh, just really quickly, um, if I wanna see 
the impact of age uh, condition with whether the person uh, was contacted by telephone, for example. Uh, here, you've got the age on the x-axis, so from, uh, from 20 to 90, and the impact, so the, the shape value here. Uh, so I see that around age 20, I have actually a high impact. The age has a high impact. Age, like between 60 and 90, it has a high impact as well. Age between 25 and, and 60 doesn't seem to have a high impact, and there you can see how uh, contacted those different groups by telephone had a different uh, outcome, and here it doesn't seem to show anything interesting. Um, yeah, not, not much to see here, but ideally where, where such a plot would be useful is that if you see that around age 60 and 90, maybe the impact of calling someone on the phone would be more important than, uh, than at another age or something. So that could be an interesting, here it turns out there is nothing interesting to see with this, this specific plot, but that's, you've got the option to, to do that and see how different, um, different features, uh, when they're linked together, they, they might uh, end up having a different impact on your final outcome. Right, uh, so that's the end of this tutorial, a bit late. Um, just to finish, um, so model interpretability, it is, it's important to give trust that your model is doing the right thing. It can allow you to debug your model uh, and really spot some biases in your data potentially and you might want to fix your model uh, after that. It allows you to explain uh, to others as well how a prediction was made if they're the decision maker, it's really important. Uh, and also like you have regulations that make it mandatory to actually explain your model. Um, now, practically, um, what, um, what you end up seeing is that, well, if, if your model is tree-based or something, SHAP will be perfectly fine and will probably allow you to do a more in-depth analysis and see, get much more information locally and globally as well. Um, so if your model is tree-based, you're in luck and you can use SHAP and it's gonna be quick enough so that uh, you don't have to wait ages to get a result. Now if your model is, if you want a method that is completely model agnostic, you can still use SHAP but it will take forever to compute. So it's either how much I guess you value, uh, you value the output of it and if you wanna take hours to compute the SHAP values uh, on this specific model to be able to interpret it later, then you might stick on SHAP. If you prefer to go for a quick ap approximation, um, you might want to, to use LIME instead. Uh, I guess that would be a rule of thumb. Yeah? Would it make sense to do like this sort of standard feature course first and then oh, yeah. complex kind of features? And yeah, so I even like something like permutation importance uh, would generalize to all, all models fairly quick to fairly quick to compute and gives you something that you can compare. So yeah, probably you'd start with permutation importance just to see maybe as a feature selection as well or just to first debugging intuitively what seems to be important or not. Uh, and then if you want to really go into more depth, SHAP or LIME depending what's, um, how much time you want to spend on it, I guess. Yeah, great, so that's all for me. <laughs>